Good morning, everyone. Happy Pi Day to all who celebrate. And welcome to the joint Spaceflight Now Lab Padre live coverage of the third test flight of SpaceX's fully integrated Starship rocket. We're joining you on a very foggy morning here in southern Texas as SpaceX is aiming to send up the world's most powerful rocket currently flying on its third integrated flight tester, IFT-3. SpaceX has a 110-minute window that opens up this morning at 7 a.m. Central Time. For those joining us around the world, that's 1200 UTC or 8 a.m. on the East Coast of the United States. I'm Will Robinson-Smith with Space Flight Now. Good to be with you all this morning as our coverage begins in Starbase in Southern Texas. I'll be providing commentary through the duration of fueling launch and hopefully a full flight profile of the Starship rocket. But of course, I'm not alone for this venture. We have a great suite of guests who are going to be joining in the conversation throughout the morning. We'll be talking about the road to this third flight of Starship, what we're anticipating with this launch, and of course, what comes next, both for the Starship program and Starbase writ large. It is now quarter to six central time, T minus one hour, 14 minutes, 36 seconds and counting. At this point in time, assuming SpaceX is on track with everything, the flight or the launch director will be conducting the poll for the start of propellant load. Part of what we'll be discussing this morning is the changes that have been made not only to Starship rocket, but also to the infrastructure that you see here on your screen and around Starbase that has allowed them to reduce the fueling time from a roughly two hour process from pole to having the rocket begin its flight to now having a timeline that is more closely aligned with what we see for a Falcon Heavy rocket launching over at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Lots of progress here at Starbase since we last joined you for our joint live coverage of an integrated flight test. We're very excited to talk about all of the milestones that have come up and some of the hopes and promises for both SpaceX and those who are going to be relying on Starship in the near and distant future. Before we really get off to the races, though, as a bit of housekeeping, I suggested at the top, this is a simulcast between Lab Padre and Space Flight Now. We have our moderators helping keep up with the live chats for both streams, so big thank you to all the mods working hard out there in cyberspace. And a thank you as well to folks who are participating in this conversation using the YouTube Super Chat on either the Lab Padre channel or on Space Flight Now. And also, big thank you to the channel members of both Lab Padre and Space Flight Now. We couldn't do what we do without the wonderful support of all of you that have been with both channels or one or the other for all this time. So we really appreciate all of your support and continued engagement. I hope you have fun this morning in the respective live chats. Channel membership with Spaceflight Now as well as Lab Padre comes with a number of membership perks, including custom multi-streams, 4K streams, and membership discounts on each channel's respective merch. Want to give a thank you also as well as we get things rolling here to all of the teams working hard behind the scenes, both on the Spaceflight Now side, as well as Lab Padre. On our side of the coin, a thanks to Stephen Young, our man in the chair in Florida, helping to steer the ship, Adam Bernstein as well, on the ground in Texas, helping to track and do some still photography. Lots of folks for Lab Padre. So thanks to folks like Lucid and Rusty Buckets and Chief. Thanks as well to the camera operators. And again, thanks to the moderators 
It certainly takes a village to make coverage like this happen, and it's a pleasure to work with a wonderful professional team on both sides. We're now T-minus 1 hour, 10 minutes, 54 seconds and counting. As I mentioned, if SpaceX is in a position to where it can target a T-0 at 7 o'clock, they will have conducted the pull for the start of propellant load. That process begins at T-minus 53 minutes. Leading up to this launch attempt, SpaceX founder Elon Musk noted there have been thousands of updates and upgrades made to both the rocket and the launch infrastructure since their second flight. As mentioned, many of those have culminated in this reduced timeline. As just a point of note for what you will be hearing during this broadcast as well, SpaceX will begin offering audio insight into their operations starting about 30 minutes before liftoff. However, because this is not a clean mission audio feed, we will be doing our best to monitor the updates as they come and relevant updates from SpaceX Mission Control. We will work to pipe those in for you as they come about so that we're all as thoroughly in the know about the fueling timeline, the health of the rocket, and their readiness to launch as they get ready for that plan liftoff. SpaceX is running its countdown, both from here at Starbase, as well as getting support, as they do with all of their launches, the control room at their headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Again, if you're just joining us on either the Lab Padre stream or Space Flight now, SpaceX is targeting a T-0 time of 7 a.m. Central, 1200 UTC. Had to catch myself from saying a T-0 liftoff because with a Starship mission, the T-0 is when things really get cooking, but liftoff is actually at T plus two seconds. Don't worry, we'll be going through the full countdown timeline and the launch timeline as well, so you know all of the ins and outs and what to expect today. As you can see, though, by watching our stream here, the weather is a bit of a mixed bag, if you will. SpaceX is not providing a robust launch weather forecast as we are used to for those of you who have been with us for a Cape-based launch, either from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station or from NASA's Kennedy Space Center. But you can see with your eyes watching the screen, there's a good bit of fog as we are watching Starbase in the pre-dawn hours. If SpaceX is able to launch at the beginning of the window, it'll be about 40 minutes or so prior to sunrise, which, once Starship clears the fog, could present a very nice jellyfish effect if it gets to the point where it's able to catch a bit of the rising sun. So we'll be looking out for that. Otherwise, the main watch item as far as weather is concerned are the winds in the area. Again, because we don't have a dedicated launch weather forecast, we're relying on some other meteorological input, such as Apple weather, which forecasts uh, general wind speeds throughout the day between 11 and 19 miles per hour with gusts of up to 25 miles per hour. Currently, we're seeing winds of 17 miles per hour from a south-southeast direction. Current wind gusts are 25 miles per hour.
We're now T minus one hour, four minutes, 23 seconds and counting. this point we're just about 10 minutes from the expected start of fueling on starship rocket which a little bit inverted from the last time we saw fueling leading up to a launch where they began by loading propellant on board the super heavy booster and then got to loading the ship up top they'll be starting with ship 28 beginning with liquid oxygen loading at T minus 53 minutes. That will be followed by loading of liquid methane on board ship 28 at T minus 51 minutes. They'll then pick up fueling booster 10 with liquid oxygen at T minus 42 minutes, followed a minute later by liquid methane load. As I mentioned up at the top, we are going to be joined by a number of guests to talk about the ins and outs of the Starship program and this mission in particular today. So I want to go ahead and bring in the first one who is going to be joining us. If you were with us last time for IFT2, you'll recall hearing his voice, or just if you've been around the block with Spaceflight now for a minute or two. Stephen Clark is currently a space reporter over at Ars Technica, was with Spaceflight now for several years, both serving as a reporter and then subsequently an editor. And again, you can currently find him working alongside Eric Berger over at Ars Technica. He's done extensive reporting on the Starship program, and we're thrilled to have him join us once again for our live Starship coverage. Stephen, welcome in. Hello, what? Hey, Will. Good morning. Starbase, Texas. Good morning to you. And so before we really get into some nitty-gritty here with all the ins and outs of the the mission and, and the changes, I want to kind of start with a, a broad overview part of our conversation and just lay the table for folks that are getting in here. As I mentioned, you've been following the Starship program for some time. We were talking throughout IFT2, the, through the launch, through the rapid unscheduled assemblies. What's kind of your feeling coming into this third integrated flight test of SpaceX's preparation and, you know, how you're feeling about their uh, possibility about getting through what is a very ambitious flight profile. Thanks, Will. Uh, yes, uh, I was here for the first two uh, launches of Starship Super Heavy last year. I think with this flight, SpaceX is really uh, interested in uh, hopefully getting to uh, near orbital velocity to get to the trajectory that uh, they want to get to with this flight after uh, getting oh so close on IFT2 back in November. And of course, uh, the first flight uh, was kind of a mixed bag of, of results. Uh, some good things, some bad things, but the uh, SpaceX recovered quickly from, from that flight last April. I think uh, on this flight, SpaceX wants to replicate, repeat what they achieved on uh, IFT2 back in November. Uh, in which uh, all 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster uh, were fired successfully, no failures in any of those engines during the climb up uh, into space. And uh, Starship, all six engines on the upper stage ignited. Of course, the reliability of the Raptor engines has kind of been a focus point for SpaceX for several years now. Uh, they're on, uh, so I believe they're on a second generation of, of Raptor with the third generation of Raptor uh, on the way. And these engines have been driven by the first generation of Raptor. So they want to replicate that. They want to uh, repeat the success they achieved with the hot staging uh, shortly after launch, around three minutes after launch, uh, when the Super Heavy separates from the Starship stage. And this flight, if, uh, if the results are good, uh, kind of opens uh, the gate for a more rapid flight data. It's... Uh, Sorry, there's some audio here at uh, our viewing site. That kind of opens the gate for uh, some uh, more rapid flight cadence here at Starbase because uh, depending on who you ask, uh, Elon Musk has said perhaps up to, uh, up to six Starship flights uh, this year. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, someone from NASA spoke to who is involved in the HLS program. 
uh, said SpaceX is targeting up to 10 Starship flights this year. Uh, sorry for the uh, noise here at the uh, viewing site. But, yeah, um, Stephen, before we get into more detail on that, um, just you know, so folks are, are kind of aware, can you describe where you're watching from and you know what the vantage point is like? Yeah, so uh, I'm at uh, the Rocket Ranch viewing site, which is about four miles away from the launch pad. Uh, so it's we're off, off to the southwest from the launch pad. I can see the lights flashing on the tower uh, off in the distance here. Excellent. And sorry to cut you off, but you were saying about um, the the hopes for this mission and, you know, SpaceX stepping through some of the, the iterative process of getting here and um, obviously hot staging worked as seemingly as well as they were hoping it did last time. Obviously, they want to replicate that. Uh, before we continue on, want to uh, thank Yote for a uh, $2 super chat here, which could bring us to another part of our conversation, Stephen, since he says or asks, uh, do you know where and how this rocket will be landing. And that is part of what will allow for some of this uh, rap more rapid cadence, potentially, of Starship, if all goes well today, since in the FAA's approval of this launch license, they noted that you know if they are able to see Starship touch down in the Indian Ocean intact, that that could open the door to potentially another or five of these missions in 2024. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so so for this flight, uh, they plan to, SpaceX plans, aims to try to recover, or not recover, but uh, guide autonomously the super heavy booster first stage back to the controlled splashdown uh, just off the coast here in South Texas, out in the Gulf of Mexico, some of these splashdowns. Uh, and then the Starship upper stage, if all goes according to plan, will actually uh, go into space, reach a velocity close to orbital velocity, fly about halfway around the world, and uh, splash down in the middle of the Indian Ocean. That's a change from the splashdown zone in the Pacific Ocean that they targeted back on IFT-1 and IFT-2. Of course, Starship didn't make it that far on those flights. Uh, so the change uh, introduced for this flight will be to splash down in the Indian Ocean. That will uh, that change allows SpaceX to actually attempt to relight a Raptor engine on Starship in space. That'll be a first, several firsts on this flight. Uh, that relight of the Raptor engine, they want to demonstrate that in vacuum uh, because for future Starship flights uh, to the moon, uh, uh, missions to deploy satellites into higher orbits, uh, all those will require multiple restarts of Raptor in space, which uh, hasn't been demonstrated yet, and they hope to uh, test that and gather some data on how that works in this flight test. Yeah, as you mentioned, that's just one of a number of firsts that they're going to be debuting with this mission. Also, around the time, or a little bit before that, uh, as they're coasting before a hopeful splashdown in the Indian Ocean, they're also going to be opening up the payload bay door for a little bit of that coast phase. This time around, there's no payload that they're going to be deploying since they're not getting up to uh, an orbital velocity. But we did see, and our friends at Lab Padre did actually capture some video of that payload door testing. So we have a, a visual idea of what that will look like. Um, but it'll certainly be noteworthy to see it on orbit since having, obviously, a, a functioning payload deployment capability is really the, the key that unlocks everything with Starship, certainly as it pertains to the Starlink constellation, right, Stephen? Yeah, that, that's right. I think uh, what we saw last year from SpaceX is they're close to getting to orbit in Starship. Uh, they, I think they have a lot more work to do when getting Starship back to Earth and getting recovery and reuse down. Obviously, with the Falcon 9 rocket, we saw uh, right out of the gate, Falcon 9 was successful in getting to orbit. It took a couple of years, actually close to five years, before SpaceX was able to uh, actually recover a Falcon and reuse it. So uh, as we move forward with Starship, uh, 
think they're going to have more tinkering and experimenting to do with landing each vehicle and reusing it. However, as soon as they can get to orbit, they can start deploying Starlink satellites. So potentially even later this year, uh, if this flight test goes well and they get to uh, the trajectory they plan to, they can we can see a Starlink version two satellites flying on Starship and they need to test this door opening and closing uh, before they can put a real uh, payload, a real satellite on the board. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if SpaceX sticks with calling them uh, Starlink version two, since we've got the B2 minis flying right now, or if as uh, Elon suggested in his company talk earlier this year, they may be called version threes. We will have to wait and see. Do you want to note a change in our graphic as, or if we can update this time, fellas in the back, we do have word from SpaceX that weather is 70% favorable for this third integrated flight test of Starship. And they note that the current T0 liftoff time is targeted for 7.30 a.m. Central. So SpaceX leaning a little bit further into their 110 minute window. They do have nearly two hours to make a run at this. As mentioned, according to their meteorologists and their outlook on the launch weather forecast, say weather is 70% favorable for today's launch attempt. Unfortunately, they didn't add any additional color as far as that's concerned. And Stephen, you heard me mention near the top of the show that we don't have a fully clear grasp on the wind limit restrictions for Starship, so that's a bit of a an unknown but beyond the the fog here it sounds like weather should not be a great impediment obviously we'll keep an eye on the winds though that's right yeah i think the the winds gusts are right now are in the 20 to 25 mile per hour range um i don't know the wind limit we don't know the wind limit for a starship but other rockets typically have a wind limit somewhere in the upper 20s or lower 30s uh, in terms of miles per hour and knots. So close to the limit. However, if uh, the speeds stay where they are, I uh, don't anticipate it breaking the limit unless there's something unique, very unique about Starship's restrictions that we don't know about. Um, so I think the winds at the surface uh, currently are, are probably a big launch item. We don't know uh, any information on the upper level winds either. Uh, so that's something, of course, that SpaceX will be monitoring throughout the countdown. In terms of cloud cover uh, and things of that nature here in South Texas, I think all that uh, looks favorable for launch. Just uh, looking out to my viewing position, we can see some scattered cloud cover, a few stars. Uh, it is quite hazy, uh, but we can see the launch pad from our location about four miles away. We can see the lights flashing on the on the uh, launch tower. So uh, I think the clouds would allow for a launch. Uh, of course, it may restrict our viewing uh, if the vehicle goes into the clouds shortly after liftoff. Yeah, which, <clears throat> of course, would be a, a bit of a bummer for those who've traveled all the way to see Perhaps their first launch of Starship. Certainly, you know, always want to, to hope for clear skies and, and good weather from a, a launch viewing perspective. And speaking to that, uh, Stephen, in your recent piece, you had talked a little bit about the jellyfish effect and the opportunity to see, you know, sort of a, on the cusp of a, a, star, or a sunrise starship launch for those who may not be familiar with what the jellyfish effect is given your long history with live launch coverage and uh, tracking rockets can you explain to the audience what the the jellyfish effect is and what they may be watching for yeah sure, sure will so when, when a rocket launches usually within uh 30 to 45 minutes of sunrise before sunrise or after sunset uh, typically, it's better before sunrise because the rocket usually heads, uh, for most launch sites, heads east into the sunrise. Uh, of course, it's dark. It's still before sunrise at the surface, at the launch pad. Uh, but as it climbs into space and uh, the sun uh, rises above the horizon and the sun starts illuminating 
the expanding exhaust from the from the engines and uh, those frozen crystals of exhaust and water vapor and other particulates that are put out by the engines, depending on you know what uh, the fuel propellant mix is. Those crystals are illuminated by the sun and uh, against a dark sky uh, from a position on the ground, it can be quite spectacular. It does like a giant jellyfish. Uh, I've also called it a teardrop type of appearance in the sky. Uh, just a, uh, a very spectacular visual as a rocket heads down range. But uh, it's usually best from my experience it's most spectacular than jellyfish around 20 to 40 minutes before sunrise. Uh, so we've just heard that the launch uh, time is now 7.30 a.m. Central Time. That's roughly eight or nine minutes before sunrise here locally in South Texas. Still will be very, very spectacular. Uh, but I think a launch at 7 a.m., the weather, you know, cloud cover for many would have been the most spectacular yeah. visual yeah. And, uh, for the jellyfish effect. But however, the better lighting at its launch time uh, will allow us to see the rocket itself a little better than we would at the, at the opening of the window when it would have, through the video, appeared just like a, a night launch uh, as it came up with that. So uh, it's still going to be a great view. Uh, the launch back in November was a few minutes after sunrise. So uh, that was also a very, very uh, a great show and very spectacular launch. Uh, very clear skies back in November. We'll see how the clouds cooperate so this morning. and still seeing a few stars, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed indeed. Just as a place setter again, because we do have an adjusted T0 here, we are now currently at T minus one hour, 17 minutes, 35 seconds and counting. Assuming SpaceX doesn't make another adjustment in the next several minutes, we are about two and a half minutes away from the point at which the launch director will take the poll on the start of propellant load. And again, that will begin with fueling of Ship 28 up top the Starship stack, T minus 53 minutes with liquid oxygen, continuing on with liquid methane two minutes after that. If you're just now joining us, first of all, welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us this morning from a very foggy star base in southern Texas as we are tracking the third integrated flight test of SpaceX's Starship rocket. Again, weather per SpaceX is 70% favorable for liftoff. And they are working their countdown towards that target at 7.30 a.m. Central. For our folks joining us around the world, that is 12.30 UTC. Back to our conversation with Stephen in just a moment. But before we step too much further into this process, and as we are coming into the start of that poll being taken, I want to go ahead and bring you through the timeline of this launch and let you know what to expect over the next hour and 15 minutes. So things will get rolling, of course, with that poll being taken at T minus one hour, 15 minutes, as I mentioned. I'll continue on with the loading of liquid oxygen on board the Ship 28 upper stage. It's followed two minutes later by the start of liquid methane loading on Ship 28. T minus 51 minutes. Starship upper stage has a propellant capacity of 1,200 tons or 2.6 million pounds. That'll be followed by booster locks load at T minus 42 minutes, followed a minute after that by a liquid methane load on the super heavy booster, booster 10. And the booster has a propellant capacity of 
3,400 tons, or 7.5 million pounds, about 10 million pounds of propellant in all. And if you weren't with us at the very start of our broadcast, the Starship fueling process, as you may have noticed if you were with us last time, is quite different this go-around, where they're loading propellant on board the Starship upper stage first, as opposed to the booster first. We'll delve into the change that made that possible in just a moment. Fueling process continues on with the Raptor engine chill down for both the booster and the ship. T minus 19 minutes and 40 seconds. It's a similar process to the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets that we see flying from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and of course, Benneberg Space Force Base in California. SpaceX will flow a small amount of liquid oxygen through the plumbing and the turbo pumps. And the, on the booster, it helps protect the 33 Raptor engines from the risk of thermal shock and damage during startup. That bit of the fueling process remains unchanged since the last flight. Moving on through, T-minus 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Booster propellant loading is complete. Fueling on the ship upper stage wraps up at T-minus 2 minutes and 50 seconds. 30 seconds before the T-0 point, SpaceX launch director will verify and go for launch. In the final 10 seconds, the new flame deflector will be activated. And as we saw last time, it seemed to prove effective at protecting the launch pad as the roads were able to open up fairly soon after launch. And much of the launch infrastructure was left pretty well intact. Finally, in the last three seconds before T0, the Raptor ignition sequence begins. And unlike a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy mission where liftoff occurs at T0, the Starship will lift off at T plus 2 seconds. But as SpaceX says, and I quote, at T0, the excitement guaranteed. We're now currently at T minus 1 hour, 11 minutes, 57 seconds and counting. A couple minutes past the point which SpaceX will have made the call on the start of propellant load. So you're standing by and waiting to see if we'll hear word from SpaceX that, in fact, fueling has begun. It's unfortunately a little difficult with the fog to see the rocket, but we will check our various camera angles and views and see if we can get a tighter shot of the ship, if possible. So as the frost starts to form on the outside, we may be able to see that a little bit clearer as the super chilled liquid oxygen begins to be loaded. Before we get any further into our launch coverage, I want to bring back in Stephen Clark and introduce a couple of additional panel guests who are just now joining us. For fans of his channel and his very thorough updates on all things Starbase and the Starship program, we are joined as we were last go around with IFT2 by Zach Golden with, again, YouTube channel CSI Starbase, known for its robust dissections of upgrades and updates on the Starship vehicle, the infrastructure at Starbase, and the program overall. Zach, it's good to have you with us again. How are you doing, sir? I am doing all right. Um, how am I sounding? I haven't had a chance to test this mic out yet. You're sounding good on my end, and unless the fellows in the back tell me otherwise, I think you're golden going out on the broadcast as well i see what you did there <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no i'm glad to join i'm sad that i wasn't able to actually uh, be there in person this time around but you know you see uh I, at least i was able to see the first two in person um you know, it's unfortunate not being able to make it for this one but uh you know it's good to be at least be on the stream with you guys 
Yeah, exactly. I know it's a uh, it's difficult having firsthand experience making your way down to Starbase down there. Uh, so it's it's a trek in the best of times, and we just uh, appreciate your insight and being with us on the stream. And hopefully, we'll all be able to make the trek down for IFT four. We are also joined this morning by a familiar voice for those coming to us from the Lab Padre side of this stream. Thomas is joining in here, who has been a longtime commentator with Lab Padre, very familiar as well with the Starship program, and has been covering the updates and changes to this launch and testing facility as it's gone through a number of iterations. Thomas, good to join. Uh, happy with us this morning. Good morning, Will. It's uh, good to be here. Can you uh, hear me all right, or am I too loud? You're sounding good to me as well, I think. Awesome. Our folks on the, the back audio switch can make any modular adjustments if need be, but I think we're ready to have a conversation, gentlemen. So we are currently sitting at T-minus one hour, eight minutes, seven seconds and counting. Still got about... 10 minutes and some change before we get into the fueling of it all. And that's actually where I'd like to start with you. And uh, guys in the back, if you've got the tank farm update video ready to go, if you can start to get that and work and bring that in when it's available. Okay, we'll pivot away from that, but we can see plenty of action happening here. So Zach, first to you, and then uh, Thomas, you can pick it up where Zach leaves off. You know, as, as Elon Musk said, coming into this launch opportunity, there have been, quote, thousands of updates to Starbase and to the Starship rocket since we last saw it fly with IFT2. You know, pretty prominently, some of the changes with the tank farm situation there. We'll come back to the changes with the rocket, but, you know, we mentioned that the fueling timeline has gotten down to something close towards a Falcon Heavy rocket. What are some of the big changes that really made this possible? And why was it important for SpaceX to get this timing down as low as they have at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty amazing. If, if any of you watched the uh, wet dress rehearsal when they did the, that was really the first time we saw the propellant loading process once they uh, made the, all those changes. Um, this is like really something they've been working towards over the past Oh, man, year and a half, I want to say. Um, they, they've always had the capability or the, um, you know, they had things kind of pretty set up for this when they added a bunch of pumps. So on the liquid oxygen side, they um, added four additional, or sorry, two additional pumps and four additional subcoolers. Um, and on the methane side, they added one additional pump and two subcoolers. I could be getting this wrong right now. Um, but essentially this allowed them to, you know, double the, or cut the prop load in half. Um, and the, the amazing part about it is, you know, once you actually see it, it's, uh, re just really crazy. If you've actually seen, you know, IFT one or IFT two, the full propellant loading process versus what it is now, it's uh, kind of shocking how quickly they're able to load propellant. Um, and uh, they've also done this while they're in the process of transitioning away from the vertical storage tanks that they have, um, that they've had since the beginning and trying to move over to the horizontal storage tanks that they've added in here. Um, and doing all of that while keeping the launch site active has been pretty impressive to watch. Um, and I think they're, you know, kind of still in the middle of that. I think it's gonna be, um, uh, the process will probably continue over the next two launches, if I had to say. Um, there will probably be a lot more progress with it after this launch, but I think um, they're going to want to continue to do this without interrupting launch site operations. So, um, yeah, I mean, beyond that, um, kind of swinging back again towards that liquid oxygen side, um, they actually are able to load propellant separately now on the ship and booster. Uh, initially, um, all, all of the pumps were filling both the ship and booster at the same time. And now they've kind of split it so that they have dedicated pumps for the ship and for the booster. So it's no longer um, a joined 
prop load process. Um, Thomas to, but, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead, Zach. No, go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, oh, no, Thomas, I was to... just wanted to bring you in here. Um, you know, Zach mentioned that they wanted to make the upgrades in a way that allowed things to keep flowing around the rest of Starbase. I mean, we saw Ship 29 roll by uh, about a day or two ago, you know, following a, a spin prime test. I mean, they're they're really able to to keep things cooking while, you know, having multiple pans on the burner, if you will. Yeah, so, like, the, the thing that, the, like, I have to always go back to is the reason why they do something like this was Elon said we're engineering things to basically be a one-hour turnaround time. So it's engineered that, yes, you can fill the, the Starship in 45 minutes. So that's part of that whole process, I think, in order to get that turnaround time to be one hour. Um, and so uh, looking at the way that you can fill it, as Zach is exactly correct. You can change it to be open valves on the ship or the booster or combination of the above, and still the flow rate is faster. Um, there's obviously limits on it by the diameter of the pipe and everything, but it's still a really intense, amazing process to see. Um, one interesting detail that we saw last time they did a, the wet dress rehearsal on the booster um, was that the eulage gases, it looked like they were being collected from the booster down the pipe, and they were basically condensating very quickly because it's basically boiling off the, uh, the cryogenics in the LOX tank, for instance. And that eulage gas just basically is bringing it down and chilling those pipes super quick. So it's just one of those little interesting, like, why is there frost coming down? Is, there, is that liquid? No, it's just the, 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 uh, the pipes were freezing very quickly. And it just made it look like there was a uh, amount of liquid coming from the top, which doesn't make any sense. It hasn't even got there yet. So just these little interesting details that you can find that go back into the, the big picture of the, the thing is that it's supposed to be at least an engineering principle of a one hour turnaround time. Will they ever hit that? Maybe not, but it's just like Falcon 9. It's been getting closer and closer to the uh, and stated goals, even though it's never going to be fully a uh, second stage launch uh, and re-entry of the uh, second stage of the Falcon 9, for instance. Starship fulfills that promise. So Elon has made many promises, and he's keeping them. It's just sometimes you have to change the vehicle to do it just incredible to see what's going on here um i'm actually live at starbase as well uh with uh steven next to me so if there's any wind or anything else uh please let me know i'll see if i can take care of that well hopefully neither of you are wearing ball caps that are going to be blowing off in the breeze there uh, at the the raptor roost zach i want to bring you back in as we have the video i alluded to a little bit earlier of the tank farm upgrades and since you've done some pretty thorough breakdowns of you know this turnover I wonder if you could just walk through for viewers if they had not been following blow by blow or, or seen some prior coverage of what we're looking at here with this uh, vertical tank farm conversion right yeah so um currently they have two vertical um liquid nitrogen tanks three liquid oxygen tanks and uh seven horizontal methane tanks um, and uh, what we're seeing right now is when they started to dismantle what was the uh, initial water tank, which kind of failed right from the start. Um, I think they probably only filled it up a few times before it actually um, started leaking from several welds that were on, on the uh, outside of the tank. And so they ended up getting rid of that tank and, uh, well, not getting rid of it, but just stopping using it. And they converted what was supposed to be two vertical methane tanks into water tanks. Um, and so what we're seeing right here in this footage is when they started to remove the first of the water tanks, um, and uh, basically they're making room for other equipment to go there. Um, and this is kind of the first first dismantling that we saw of this, and it was a pretty good show that they put on. Uh, I think they, I want to say it was about three days overall that it took for them to chop all of this stuff up. Um, once they got those out of the way, uh, they started adding some reinforcement onto um, one of the remaining water tanks. And this one that they're showing right here is the liquid nitrogen tank, or one of the liquid nitrogen tanks. And uh, I always found this a little bit interesting because this is kind of something that I think maybe should have been there from the start. Um, 
you know, it, it is possible that had they had this kind of reinforcement, then it, the tanks wouldn't have been as damaged as they were after IFT-1. Um, you know, it seems like they really are focusing on not having these cave in um, from the pressure of those Raptor engines. And uh, it's good to see that they've done that, but I, I, do, I do wonder if, they, if the tank farm would have lasted longer had they done something like that from the start. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I think they were kind of wanting to transition into these horizontal tanks uh, for a long time. Um, overall, they're, you know, lower profile. Uh, they're not sticking up in the air. They're a little bit further away from the launch site and, or sorry, the actual launch pad, and they're uh, easier to protect. So they're able to put a wall that's taller than the tanks instead of the uh, berm that they have adjacent to the launch pad, which is um, really only covers, I think, like maybe like a quarter of a, or like a, a third of the tanks um, from the bottom up. So not, not very effective. If you've ever seen any of the static fires or launches from one of the uh, views that kind of show it from a distance, you can see that the exhaust plume and, um, you know, pressure wave basically just goes straight through <laughs> the horizontal, the uh, vertical tanks. Um, I've always found that kind of entertaining to watch it go straight through there because, you know, I think we all really expected the berm to send it over the tanks uh, and not through the tanks as it has. Um, but I think they're probably excited to uh, get this job finished because it's it's taking a lot of effort to do this conversion. And um, I mean, it, it's just so much that they have to do in order to pull this off and doing it without interrupting um, launch site operations, like I mentioned before, is is probably the most impressive part of it. I'm sure I'm leaving some stuff out here. I'm, I'm uh, waking myself back up. I just got off work after 12 hour shift and sitting here with a coffee in my hand. So I may be missing some things as well. Well, we'll let the uh, caffeine drip do its magic. I'll pivot <laughs> just, we'll pivot to Steven as you sip on your Joe there, Zach. Um, you know, as we've been talking about the updates to infrastructure and continuing on with making it more increasingly efficient here at Starbase, Stephen. Um, you know, we've also in Florida been watching the progress on both where things stand with the current launch tower over at 39A, but also in some new developments. If folks haven't been watching this space terribly closely, SpaceX has its eyes on another launch location for its Starship vehicle in Florida, that primarily being Slick 37. And if that sounds familiar to viewers out there, that's because it's the location where currently ULA's Delta IV heavy rocket launches and it's preparing for its final flight. But Stephen, if you could describe to viewers, you know, what SpaceX is doing uh, in partnership with the Department of the Air Force in scoping that out, what they've been up to recently. Yeah, sure thing. Well, of course, SpaceX wants to have multiple launch pads for Starship. They need to have multiple launch pads for Starship to achieve uh, many of the things that they want to do with this vehicle, uh, including these uh, lunar missions for NASA. They need these two launch pads for that. Um, so uh, down in Florida, as uh, you've seen, they partially constructed uh, a launch site for Starship, that launch X 39A, uh, and plan uh, for the second launch pad on for the Space Coast is uh, first option for SpaceX. Their preferred option is to take over uh, Space Launch Complex 37, Slick 37, over at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, and so uh, last month, the Air Force, the Space Force uh, announced uh, they were beginning what they call a scoping uh, uh, process for uh, Slick 37 for SpaceX to eventually move in there after ULA flies the final Delta IV Heavy uh, from that launch pad later this month. So uh, we've seen a series of public meetings in the last couple of weeks in Florida, uh, in person and virtual meetings. Just to uh, those are kind of perfunctory meetings. I listened to one of them uh, where the the, the uh, officials from uh, the Air Force and from Jacobs, which is the pro contractor. Uh, that is overseeing part of this environmental review process. It just kind of gives an overview of what the plan is. Uh, but uh, there will be a, a extensive environmental review that the Space Force will be managing in concert with NASA and the FAA. 
uh, for uh, you know, to assess the environmental impact of uh, Starship launches from Slick 37 at the Cape. The uh, backup plan, if uh, something uh, stands in the way of uh, SpaceX moving in at Slick 37, is to build a greenfield site, a brand new launch pad, uh, just north of Slick 37 between uh, Pad 37 and Pad 40, which is uh, SpaceX's primary, most often used launch pad uh, for the Falcon 9 uh, as a potential Starship launch pad. So, currently plans for at least two Starship launch pads in Florida. Uh, the one that's partially built kind of been in mothballs for a few, uh, over a year now at Pad 39A. And uh, also this other launch pad that uh, SpaceX wants to build at Slick 37. So uh, the Slick 37 launch pad for Starship, I think is still probably a couple of years away from being uh, operational. In fact, probably over a year away from construction beginning uh, on that launch pad because ULA needs to decommission the Delta for Heavy. Space Force will need to uh, go through a leasing process to uh, lease it out to SpaceX. Uh, and the construction and environmental views will all take a, a year or more. So that's still probably in the 2026 time frame, the very earliest we can see Starship at Slip 37, maybe even later than that, uh, and probably at least a year away from construction beginning if it moves forward. Uh, one thing I'll note with uh, SpaceX's plans in Florida is uh, there were some environmental reviews going on with NASA uh, building a new launch pad for Starship uh, on Kennedy Space Center property north of uh, Complex 39. That was going to be launch Complex 49. Uh, that is currently on hold. Uh, I don't think it's been entirely abandoned at this point, uh, but it clearly is taking a second or even third seat uh, behind uh, SpaceX's plans at 39A and at 37. Yeah, I was. Uh, if you had not brought that up, I was going to make sure we briefly touched on LC forty nine up there, which is about as far north on the KSC property that you can build a, a launch pad. Though it is quite marshy and perhaps not the most ideal for constructing a new pad. But obviously, everywhere in that area has you know some pluses and minuses and potential drawbacks, as it is all enveloped in the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, and there's a lot of environmental concerns to take into consideration. So just to put a, a pin on this part of our chat, the draft environmental impact statement for considering uh, Space Launch Complex 37 as the primary point of consideration or uh, Slick 50 as a backup, that draft EIS will be issued in December 2024 with a final EIS anticipated in September of 2025. We're now T-minus 51 minutes, 22 seconds and counting for this current flight of Starship since there's plenty of Starship goodness to go around before we start talking about other pads and additional things. At this point, if SpaceX is on track with its fueling process, they will have begun both uh, locks load as well as starting to load methane in uh, right about now on the ship 28 upper stage coming up next on the fueling timeline will be fueling of the super heavy booster starting with box load at t minus 42 minutes and at t minus 41 minutes they'll be loading liquid methane into the super heavy booster just want to remind folks, if you are joining us live on either the Lab Padre side of the stream or Space Flight Now, you could use the YouTube Super Chat feature if you'd like to leave a comment or question for any of our panelists about this mission, about the Starship program, some of the changes that have been made. And as long as your comment or question is appropriate to be read on the show, it's very important, we'd love to bring you into a robust conversation as we continue on for the next 50 minutes and five seconds as it currently stands before liftoff of the Starship launch vehicle on its third integrated test flight from Starbase here in Southern Texas. Taking a look at a slightly wider vantage point, we can see a lot of vapor mixing in with the clouds near the tank farms that we've been talking about. Thomas, I want to pivot back to you since you've been here and watching the Starship program develop here in Southern Texas. 
for quite some time. We had the chance, obviously, through a number of tests, but certainly through the second integrated flight test of Starship to see how well things were going to withstand from the upgrades made following the first integrated flight test. So I wonder just your thoughts on how well you think we'll see a continuation of, say, for instance, the water deluge system and some of the other fortification measures that uh, SpaceX has put in. And like Zach mentioned, you know, some of the, the walls that are designed to protect the tank farms. Yeah, so there's been quite a few upgrades uh, over time here that SpaceX is always improving. So there's been hundreds of improvements upon the Starship and a hundred more for each iteration, even just from this vehicle to the next to the next and previous vehicles, of course. So that is the improvement that SpaceX is is, is pushing. Some of those improvements, like the 17 improvements that uh, basically were the safety and other things for the FAA to basically say, yes, we're we're go ahead with this particular launch. So having those types of incremental improvements is what is putting SpaceX ahead on this. Uh, you mentioned the uh, water deluge system. They have additional capacity. That I haven't seen them hook it up yet for the uh, pneumatic system that's basically putting the back pressure on the water deluge system. So they obviously have reasons for doing things like that. I haven't seen exactly what they uh, or plan to do with that exact uh, system if they are planning on using it for uh, basically cross-feeding back into perhaps another uh, uh, water deluge tank system just right next to it for the next orbital tower and fuel farm and everything else that's going there. So that's just one of those things that we have to keep an eye out. And it's a little bit of speculation, of course, but as long as we understand that the, the signs of what they do is usually a sign of the direction they go. Sometimes they have a really good idea. They won't let it go. Uh, fuel tanks at the the header tanks, for instance, they they changed them from the like the center of the vehicle, uh, actually from the top of the vehicle to the center of the vehicle, and then back to the top of the vehicle. So that was Mark One, for instance. Uh, back around those days, the the vehicle was looking so good, and it has like millions of improvements by now, <laughs> equivalent for Mark One uh, in everything from design to the uh, actual outcome of the vehicle, of course. Anyways, the, the the improvements have been just massive and successful. Uh, we obviously saw between ITF-1, the issues with the water deluge uh, not being uh, present. It basically just had a bit of a Firex system, and that was about it, uh, with a bit of water that was basically uh, just a way to reduce any uh, fire or anything else uh, after the launch. But it really didn't help them much, <laughs> because the vehicle took away the pad. They had to uh, uh, basically dig away a little bit more. And actually, I heard something like it saved them a week. So it was uh, kind of interesting that it was a benefit. <laughs> but they were going to replace it anyways. And they got the uh, the steel plates up and with water deluge system. And things have been very much improved upon as far as all of that goes. There could be other improvements that are made, like if you did water deluge on the legs and the, the top of the platform or other interesting things that we haven't seen signs of, but it's just been uh, an idea that's been running around since uh, like almost day one when the deluge system was being uh, introduced here. But it's just always interesting how SpaceX makes those improvements only for like, let's say the longevity of the, the vehicle, because that's one of the next stages that they will be doing and the infrastructure uh, behind it. Uh, right now, it's just making sure it works. Uh, they have to basically do all the testing for the vehicle, of course, but they're getting close. That This launch is just, that's what, uh, can't see the launch timer here. 45 minutes away? Yeah, that's pretty close. <laughs> so we'll find out all the improvements if they've worked uh, properly on this vehicle from the last vehicle. If it makes it further, then everything has worked and there's no other hidden bugs or ghosts in the system that uh, they haven't weeded out before. So I'm pretty sure that they're going to be highly successful on this. Back yeah, to you. I wanna, yeah, no, sorry. I was just uh, talking on the, the back channel here. Um, taking a look at the closer shot of uh, Ship 28, the vantage point you're seeing here is with the hot staging ring at the bottom of your screen. 
We're not seeing any signs of fueling, it appears, at this point. Uh, Zach, I want to bring you in here uh, since you've watched, obviously, the, the wet dress rehearsal and the process of prop load as it currently stands now. Given where we believe we are in the timeline, if SpaceX has not made another adjustment, what should we be seeing on Ship 28 at this point if, in fact, we are 44 minutes out? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I don't see any frost line yet, um, but I guess with 45 minutes out, I mean, you could they could uh, pretty much top off both vehicles in that time. So I guess once they get started, it will be pretty quick. But um, right now, it still seems like they're in the pre-till process, even though it normally doesn't take this long. Um, I think uh, once they really get started pumping, we'll see a massive uh, lake of fog near the launch pad. Um, but uh, it's tough to tell right now with the visibility if they've started or not yet, but I don't think they have. Yeah, just uh, sort of bouncing against the timeline as presented by SpaceX, we're about 10 minutes, or we would be 10 minutes into locks load on ship 28 at this point. So what it would have expected to see, like you said, some type of frost fuel line, uh, which suggests that they may have made another adjustment to the T0, and we will stand by for additional Is that the adjusted timeline, um, plus 30, 30 minutes? That's what it appears to be, but we're waiting to get full confirmation of that, but it sounds like that's a, about the slide to the right that we're seeing. So as we mentioned at the top of the broadcast and we'll reiterate throughout, this is a 110 minute window. So just a little under two hours that opens up for SpaceX or opens up for SpaceX at 7 a.m. Central. So they do have opportunities to pivot and move within it obviously not an infinite amount of time but we will continue to watch and wait for official word from spacex as far as where they are in the countdown process and if in fact fueling has begun although it certainly appears that it may not have started just yet we're working to get more official confirmation Yeah, and just in the realm of indications that things may be slipping in addition to not seeing evidence of fueling, SpaceX has adjusted their start time for their live stream by about 30 minutes, which would suggest, given that they said they're going to be starting 30 minutes before that T0 liftoff, that we're probably pushing back to a T0 now of roughly 8 o'clock. So we'll go ahead and make some adjustments on our T0 countdown to compensate once we have firm word of that. But the time you see of T minus 40 minutes and 18 seconds and counting, that will likely be changing very soon. So just to give all of you out there in the audience a heads up on that. A quick update, Will. Uh, just uh, checking out the weather here. Uh, directly above we have a few open uh, cloud areas we had uh, we just saw stars uh, across uh, half the sky so it's going to be hit or miss here uh, when we get to that point but it looks like it'll still be fairly clear uh, at least up to over I'd say 20,000 feet but that's just uh, guessing by eye <laughs> it's pretty dark still uh, but it looks pretty clear in some places uh, hoping for a 
the rest of the day to be pretty clear too. Who knows? We'll uh, we'll wait and see. Appreciate that, Thomas. You know, and bring the the panel in to to discuss this. Um, start with uh, with Thomas, and then work our way to to Stephen, since you both are there next to each other. Want to bring this traffic view in from uh, one of our spaceflight now photographers, Adam Bernstein, who's got more of an eagle eye view of the whole situation. And you can see just a, a heavy stream of traffic here on South Padre Island of folks coming in trying to catch this third flight test of Starship. Thomas, just walk us through the, the interest and intrigue that you've seen as the Starship program has built up. I mean, I think fortunately for a lot of college students and, and people that are in school, this is a, a Pi Day launch opportunity, and you know a lot of folks are in the middle of spring break, so sort of a, a unique circumstance where you know you have a, a high interest rocket and a great opportunity for folks to get out there, and it seems like a lot of people are taking advantage of that. Well, the two don't help with the hotel prices, first off, <laughs> but the, uh, the the best part about this is I've met uh, oh, dozens of people so far all over the world, uh, people from the Netherlands. Uh, all over the U.S., of course, whoever can come and make it uh, to this flight. It's one of those things where if, if it's scheduled in advance, people can actually make it. Um, and the, the traffic here you see at uh, South Padre Island, you have everything from SpaceX workers to uh, just visitors from all over the state out of town, just barreling through trying to uh, get to Isla Blanca Park. And uh, some people even go in for boats and things like that. It's very packed. I had a friend who uh, it, he was like three or four hours through that traffic and was barely on time, uh, like 30 minutes before launch. And it's uh, it, it's it's kind of a <laughs> it's a little rush at the last minute when you like, are we going to make it? Oh, we made it. Oof. <laughs> but the, uh, the excitement for Starship is tremendous down here. Uh, talk to people uh, in town for Brownville uh, who he was like, yeah, the last one, it was just shaking the building. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm missing it. I'm missing it. So he has to run outside and grab his other coworkers. And I told him the, tomorrow uh, we're looking at around, uh, it was around seven. Things have changed, uh, obviously. But uh, this is still going to be incredible for everybody uh, locally to, to feel, hear this. Um, it's, it's something that's kind of strange. Some of the locals will will still not know what's going on here, but they know who Elon is and what SpaceX is. They just don't realize what, what's going on at this facility. Um, it's just too interesting to, to meet the people at the beach sometimes, but that's what you get. <laughs> They're here for the, the beach itself. Uh, and we get to teach them about Starship and they're really excited to hear about it. So it's always fun. Well, and speaking of waiting, first off, I want to thank um, Rob for a $10 super chat. And noting as SpaceX has officially come out and said that the new liftoff time is targeting 8.02 a.m. Central. That is 9.02 a.m. Eastern. So just noting that as we're now have our countdown clock updated for a T minus one hour, seven minutes, 46 seconds and counting. You mentioned a lot of folks that are excited to see this. SpaceX also noted that the team is, quote, clearing a few boats from the keep out area in the Gulf of Mexico, which, you know, they put out word of notice quite a bit ahead of time. The the notice to mariners is what it's officially called. And, you know, Stephen, as as someone who has also covered a number of Cape based launches that have been uh, scuttled at the buzzer beater by ships, this is something that we're quite familiar with, um, you know, but for folks that are not as savvy with NOTAMs and, you know, this keep out space, you talk about why that's so important and, you know, SpaceX's sort of history with this. Yeah, well, uh, for every rocket launch in Florida here, uh, uh, in Texas as well, they want to make sure there's no uh, unauthorized boats or aircraft around the launch site for public safety reasons. And of course, that is also uh, a big part of the FAA licensing process uh, because the FAA license requires that the risk of uh, 
uh, a casualty, as they put it in the in the words of that uh, license, is at a certain threshold. And to, in order to meet that, you have to clear a certain space around the launch pad, around the launch site, and around the flight corridor of all nine essential personnel or, or uh, non-involved personnel with uh, the operation. So uh, these maps are published uh, days, sometimes longer in advance, uh, and they want to make sure that the uh, people are aware of the local area to stay out of those zones. But it's a normal, even around Florida, even around uh, Cape Canaveral, where launches are uh, uh, much more routine than they are here. Uh, people venture into those uh, keep out zones on a pretty regular basis. Even professional uh, mariners, like cruise ship, uh, I think a couple of years ago, was in the uh, keep out zone and caused the launch to be scrubbed. So it happens. It's unfortunate. Uh, and uh, the way to tackle that is to widely disseminate and publicize when the launch is happening, where to stay out uh, ahead of time. Yeah, I, I remember the the launch that you're talking about, I think that was, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was actually an Atlas V rocket um, that was launching for United Launch Alliance when a, a cruise ship got a little little too close and had to scoot away. And they got some virtual scolding on Twitter, now known as X at the time. So you know, I think uh, the folks at Port Canaveral certainly went around and, and talked to all of the cruise lines and re-reminded them about the importance of that balance between the vessels and where they need to be and the timing of when they can move in and out of port, which is you know obviously really busy since uh, Port Canaveral, one of the busiest ports in the United States in part because of SpaceX activities, but also got, I think, last I checked, I think 10 home-ported cruise ships from I think five different cruise lines. So it's it's a very busy song and dance at uh, you know, in Florida and around the, the Kennedy Space Center certainly. Since I went ahead and mentioned it, I'll, I'll go ahead and bring up a view of another SpaceX vehicle sitting at the pad hoping and waiting for launch. This is Falcon 9 rocket which was set to launch last night on the Starlink Group 6-44 mission. But SpaceX scrubbed the launch about two minutes prior to liftoff. They had not stated a reason for why the scrub last night, but they are currently targeting their backup opportunity tonight at 7.04 p.m. Eastern. So SpaceX potentially setting them up for another double launch day this time with Starship and Falcon 9 hosting Starlink on board. And uh, Stephen, I'll go to you first, and then um, I have a question for, for you, Zach. But we talked a little bit earlier in the broadcast, but for folks that weren't with us in that part of the conversation, I mean, just seeing the duality of, of these two rockets for SpaceX kind of tells the story of their venture as far as the the profit side of this whole uh, space flight equation, that they really want to try to ramp up the cadence as they have been with deploying Starlink satellites and Starship is the key to that whole venture, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Starship uh, is carrying uh, 150 metric tons uh, nominally uh, into low Earth orbit. Uh, that could be a little higher uh, depending on what kind of upgrades SpaceX can introduce on the vehicle going forward. Uh, however, it's vital for Starship uh, to be uh, ready to start launching uh, these next generation of Starlink satellites. And I think that is going to be a very high priority for SpaceX this year is to uh, get Starship into launching Starlink satellites, uh, especially for uh, the direct to sell network. That's going to be a big part of what SpaceX is doing this year. Some of those will be launching on Falcon 9, and some of those uh, uh, will be launching on Starship, and Starship will enable SpaceX to roll out that service much more rapidly than they could with uh, just Falcon 9 alone. So I think uh, that'll be a big priority for SpaceX because uh, it's going to be a money-making venture. Starlink obviously is uh, a very profitable enterprise. Uh, it could be a very profitable enterprise for uh, SpaceX. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of insight into those financials, but obviously it's a lot of lucrative 
than just being a, out here launch company in our space for transportation. Going forward, I think that's uh, going to be a big emphasis this year. And while they're launching those strong satellites, we'll see in the SpaceX continue to experiment with recovery of the booster, eventually down the road recovery of Starship. I think that will take a little longer to perfect uh, and master than the booster, just because SpaceX has experience with, with, with recovering Falcon 9 boosters. Uh, but uh, you don't need to have recovery uh, perfected and mastered uh, just to launch Starlink satellites. So I think uh, we'll see SpaceX doing that going forward. And I'll note just uh, last week, I think, uh, there was a 24-hour period where SpaceX launched three Falcon uh, 9 rockets and performed a countdown dress reversal for Starship. So not out of the realm of possibility later this year, we could see a, a Starship uh, on the same day as multiple Falcon 9s. Uh, today, as you mentioned, we may see a Falcon 9 Starship uh, you know, roughly uh, half a day apart. Well, and, and just to, to punctuate the multiple spinning plates SpaceX had that day as all of those missions were going and work you had a transporter launch that was deploying satellites as a Starlink launch was going up as a Dragon spacecraft was making its way to the International Space Station as they were preparing to bring a couple of days following that the Crew 7 Dragon Endurance home from the ISS so it's I mean to those who have not been following just how quickly SpaceX has been able to, you know, really master the the art of having many dynamic missions in work simultaneously. It's been quite the feat to see unfold. And um, Zach, want to bring you in just because we were talking a little bit earlier before you hopped on the stream here about some of SpaceX's objectives with this third integrated flight test. One of them, as they are in the coast phase, um, obviously they want to you know, see a continued success with uh, the hot staging process, but you know, to the point of payloads in the future, seeing the, the payload door open and uh, close while it's in the coast phase, we didn't see that before in the, the first two iterations. Can you talk about the development of the, the door and some of the you know more intricate mechanics of this operation that we'll be watching. And actually, before you jump in, I'm so sorry, I uh, do have word from SpaceX within the last 10 seconds that they are shifting the T-0 again, uh, quote, for a few more minutes to give boats time to clear out of the keep out area. They are now targeting 10, or excuse me, 8, 10 a.m. Central, 9, 10 a.m. Eastern, 13, 10 UTC. So if uh, the guys at the back, if you haven't already updated the countdown clock, just a heads up to you there that we'll need to make one more adjustment, at least for now. All right, Zach, go ahead. I love those boats. Um, boats, boats, boats. Yeah, so, I mean, the the payload door has kind of been um, <clears throat> an evolving situation. Um, they first, I think the first ship with the payload door was ship 24. Um, and... Uh, they actually ended up welding that shut and they did the same thing on ship 25. And um, I think they were really just having like structural issues. Um, we, we don't know, we've never gotten like official word from SpaceX on what exactly the problem was, but I guess from our own observations, we've kind of assumed that um, they had some sort of issues with the uh, um, actual door mechanism binding up on itself. Um, and that would be due to um, just insufficient structural um, integrity and having the actual um, payload section of the ship be a little bit too heavy and um, kind of just not being able to hold itself up properly with um, while the door is open and even when it was closed. So they ended up welding that payload door shut on ship 24 and 25. Um, so it was never really even an option for them to test this on um, flight one and two. So um now they've finally seem to have gotten this uh issue resolved they did um a uh structural verification test that once they made some changes to the actual um the uh, uh reinforcements on the exterior of the vehicle like surrounding surrounding the payload door 
Um, they performed a structural verification test uh, a few months ago and everything seems to have gone well. And um, I believe we saw them test that payload door. Uh, I think it was shortly after the static fire test of t ship 28. Um, so I think some of us, me especially, I was kind of hoping that we would see them uh, take ship 28 back to the high bay and, and possibly um, insert a dummy payload. Um, but it seems like they are fine with just actually testing the door mechanism itself, um, which is still good progress. I think, uh, you know, if that works out well, then on the next launch, hopefully we'll see them actually be able to test a dummy payload load or actually launch live satellites. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, they're making great progress on that. I think, you know, a lot of us were really worried about how that's going to work. Um, you know, if they're having issues on a smaller door like this, uh, it's kind of difficult to imagine how they're going to pull off a much larger door when they have different types of um, payloads that they're inevitably going to be carrying. So, um, yeah, but on this mission, we, we should see them. I don't, I don't know if we'll actually, we probably won't be able to actually see it. We'll probably just get confirmation on telemetry whether or not the door actually opened. Uh, but it would actually be nice if they had some onboard cameras inside of that payload base so you could actually see it open up uh, that would be a pretty unique view and probably unexpected if it actually ends up happening um but uh yeah i think that's one of the exciting things and they also are going to be testing the um propellant transfer between the main tank and the header tanks um this is one of the uh tests that's required for uh NASA, and I'm not actually sure if it's related to the engine relight. I think it's two separate things, um, but they're also going to be testing engine relight. Um, I guess we've been assuming that that will be related to the entry burn. Um, but at the same time, I'm not sure if they're going to achieve an altitude that would be or an altitude and velocity that would make it necessary for them to actually perform an entry burn. So I think it's just testing the actual relight in orbit. Um, maybe Thomas might be able to add on, add on to that one. Yeah, Thomas, if you'd like to chime in? Yeah, so uh, the last part, I missed what you said. You said that the uh, they're, they're basically testing the, the satellite in orbit specifically, or the just opening the payload bay door specifically and to test it that way uh because the the thing that to me is that like being able to open the payload door, bay door uh, oh sorry let me yeah go ahead and answer that quite for the first question because i make sure i got the question right uh zach yeah sorry go ahead what was that that last part you said though Want to make um, sure i was I talking about it. the uh the engine relight in orbit um, but I'm not okay. being, I'm not sure if it's actually related to deorbit because I don't know if they're going to achieve the um, altitude and velocity that would make it necessary to perform a deorbit burn, um, or if it's just you know only testing that, but it's not actually a deorbit burn. Yeah, so we keep seeing the the change the uh, or having two locations um, for the deorbit burn. So now it's basically past Madagascar was the Indian Ocean. It's like the Indian Ocean is if it doesn't work, because you're going to have some issues there. Um, but then, you know, the deorbit burn, they're, they're having to burn for at least a few seconds. That's going to change some delta V. Uh, that's going to be interesting. But there's a, they do have quite a large corridor, so you could stick it in either category. They do basically have to confirm that this vehicle is safe for being able to re-enter, because it's a very large vehicle, obviously. Uh, you don't want this sitting up there or sitting up there in pieces in orbit. So that's why this is in basically orbital velocity, but not the orbit itself. It's not low Earth orbit. It's orbital velocities. It's intersecting Earth. So, uh, it, its orbit would basically intersect the uh, Earth itself. So um, the other part is the payload bay door, having that open and closing. If they show that video, it would be a great demonstration video for basically their, their customers to say, our payload bay door systems are ready for our satellites. They can be ready for yours too soon. Like that is the direction that you want to show that this vehicle is now capable on all fronts. 
Yeah, that's certainly something that I think we're we're all hoping that they have proper onboard cameras, either internally or externally, that can show that demonstration. And you know, it'd be great if if they could give us uh, all real time updates on the progress and success or challenges of the uh, internal propellant transfer as a NASA tipping point demonstration that'll be happening on this mission, sort of a, a precursor, if you will, to the much more dynamic ship to ship propellant transfer that to Zach's point will be necessary, not only for SpaceX's future deep space ambitions, but certainly needed to be proven out uh, for NASA as its Artemis program is relying on SpaceX's Starship to be the human landing system that'll bring astronauts to the surface of the moon on both the Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions currently, and more than likely others down the road as well. Got Blue Origin with its Blue Moon lander in the works for Artemis 5, but as far as Artemis 6 and beyond, we'll have to see where NASA uh, puts its chips in and decides to award that contract and when the bidding for that will actually begin. Currently sitting at T minus 58 minutes, six seconds and counting. We get ready to hopefully see some evidence of the start of prop load. Again, as we've had to adjust the T0 a, a few times here, but we should be about four and a half minutes from the start of lox load on the ship upper stage. Unfortunately, the timing is such that the fog is beginning to clear and we're getting a bit of a better view on Starship itself. So we should hopefully be able to see the frost line forming. But gentlemen, it's not all business here, as we do like to have a little bit of fun with these live streams. And so want to bring in some of the hard work of folks behind the scenes and not only go through a timeline of the Starship program, but also a little bit of trivia mixed in here as well. So want to start with this first, obviously, still present star hopper who is I suppose an unofficial mascot of the star base down there as you can see here on your screen this is the first starship prototype to built and to take flight which achieved a 150 meter hop during a single raptor engine ignition and we've seen a, a number of hop tests from some other companies uh, at least a, a chinese one in the not too distant past so trivia question I'll uh, I'll put this to Stephen first, and of course, folks play along at home. Stephen, how long did Starship's 150 meter hop last when it was conducted? Well, you're really testing my radar. It's been a while since it's happened. Uh, up against a total guess. Sorry, you're breaking up for just a second. What's your final answer? I'm saying uh, it's been a while since this happened, uh, so you're testing my memory. I'm going to guess A. Well, you would be close. The answer is actually B, 57 seconds, but not too far off. All right, Thomas, I'm coming to you on this next one. Moving on down the road on November 20th, 2019, the first full-scale Starship prototype completed construction on September 29th, 2019 was partially destroyed during a cryogenic roof test. So question to you, which part of the structure failed on Mark 1? Was it the forward dome, A, B, the aft dome, or C, the common dome? Forward dome. Andy would be correct. It was, in fact, the forward dome. That, that thing blew its top. <laughs> it was spectacular. <laughs> We'll put this one out to. I think the launch mount is venting right now. It's a little tough to see on the camera, but I think if we can zoom in, it's the launch mount has started venting, which is 
uh, a good sign. By the way, it's not just clearing up uh, on the site. It's clearing up uh, in the sky as well. We've got a lot of uh, the, uh, what is that called? The haze from the ocean coming in, but it's it's burning off very quickly. And it's uh, at least for above uh, where we're at. And uh, I believe the, the tower's at. It's not too bad. Good eyes to all of you for that. And hopefully that venting does mean that they're conditioning to start prop load. We are currently T minus 53 minutes, 52 seconds and counting. So Loxode should get rolling in less than a minute here. And that'll of course be followed at T minus 51 minutes by the loading of liquid methane on board ship 28 up top the starship stack. Yeah, it's a bit tough to see it because of the direction that the wind is blowing, but on the left side of that leg, you can just barely see the venting um, through between the stairs. Gotcha, yeah, I can see a little bit of that here. And you can see it even better on this view right here. Mm -hmm. So that's see, great that's news. We're definitely getting close. We're definitely getting close and hopefully they've had enough time to clear out all the boats from the keep out zones. So if we don't have any more marine interference and everything is healthy with the vehicle, hopefully it's just down to the weather, which unfortunately we haven't got a device yet to fully control that. So we will just keep our fingers crossed and see how things progress throughout the rest of the launch window and the opportunity again. SpaceX targeting that T0 as it currently stands at 8.10 a.m. Central, 9.10 a.m. Eastern, 13.10 UTC for our friends from around the world. Um, so I didn't mean to uh, get us away from the question, but that was a little strategic because I don't, I'm not sure if I know the answer to this trivia question. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. It is some some tough questions that the the fellows in the back came up with. So we'll we'll pose our next one to the audience out there. Before we continue on, do want to thank uh, some folks for their support as we continue to step through. Really appreciate all of the live viewers who are joining on either the Space Flight Now live stream or Lab Padre's live stream. If you haven't already, be sure to click the like button on whichever stream you're watching and share it with your friends and family as we are getting close to the launch of Starship on its third integrated test flight. We'd love to bring more folks into our live coverage in a great robust conversation with some wonderful folks. I want to thank Paul Tom for a uh, $2 super chat helping to support our coverage this morning. Thank you, Paul. Another $2 super chat from Benoit Schillings. A little bit of support there. Really appreciate that, Benoit. Aerospace rocketry with a little bit of skills behind their fandom. They say, we build and fly scale rockets, and they're currently working on a 148th scale of Starship. So before we continue on with some more comments from our respective communities, uh, to you, Thomas, um, and we've been talking about the excitement and the sort of energy built around Starship, but I guess just, you know, to expand it out a little bit from there, you know, and especially a site like Starbase, you know, talk about the impact that that has uh, for being able to engage people, you know, through just the incredible public facing access to, to see the hardware here, but also just, you know, some some science centers around the country that are also doing great work, like the uh, California Science Center that's currently building a, a facility around the only you know, flight stack of a uh, space shuttle. I mean, it's all sort of working together to, to bring people into the excitement and engagement of space flight, right? 
Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, speaking of California, Berkeley, if I remember right, uh, they've proposed and have plans and have uh, and been in talks with SpaceX about putting a ground-based telescope that has been modified, uh, or not spaced, a ground-based telescope in space, um, which is huge because it's basically like looking at another Hubble, um, but it's going to be very cost-effective because Starship makes it such. The, the possibilities with this vehicle are endless and the universities are going to be all over it because the opportunities that it provides are cost reduction and large mass, which that means science experiments that basically NASA would not normally do, or if they do, it's like in a very small scale. And sometimes you need these things in large scale. Um, and of course, manufacturing and everything else beyond that, but for university sakes, it's, it's a big deal as well. Yeah. And Zach, to, to Thomas's point of, of universities jumping in on the, the bandwagon with all these various opportunities. I mean, we just saw uh, with the transporter 10 mission launching from Vandenberg space force base in California, a number of university based payloads, including some that were working with NASA and, and their experts to to get to their low earth orbit destination um I mean, it just seems like there's such a plethora of various avenues to get to either the iss or to low earth orbit that you know it's it's exciting to see some of the new science that's coming on board that never could have existed before just because of the prohibitive cost yeah definitely i mean the, the transporter missions are really awesome as cool that SpaceX showed um, the uh, full payload on the inside of the fairing on the last on the latest launch. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to see if they're a ever reach that point with Starship that they're e that they would even consider doing those type of ride share missions. I don't know if they've actually stated that they plan to. Um, but man, I mean, you could probably put a year's worth of payload on just one Starship if they ever end up doing that. Yeah, that'll, that that's a good point. It, I mean, it'll it'll just be interesting to see what a um, a multi manifested Starship stack looks like, both in the integration of the vehicle, um, you know, what the deployment looks like, what the the door operation is going to be once it's up and running. Speaking of up and running, we're T minus forty six minutes, forty four seconds, and counting, just a couple minutes away from. The fueling process starting on the Super Heavy booster. Again, that will begin at T minus 42 minutes with the booster lock load. A minute after that, liquid methane will start flowing onto the Super Heavy booster. Yeah, the venting out of the launch mount is getting pretty heavy right now. Yeah, certainly a, a good sign there. And, you know, we don't see quite as much venting for uh from from the the tanks area as we do on a, a falcon 9 or falcon heavy mission but you know zach I, I suppose if you could just you know now that we're getting a clearer view with less fog just explain to folks you know at a ground level what some of the vapor they're seeing is at this point um yeah so the um on the right side i guess at the tank farm they're uh, it's a little confusing. Usually you don't see the um, venting inside of the tank farm once they've started um, pre-chilling the lines going to the launch mount. So um, the uh, usually you'll see the actual launch mount venting and it'll get heavier once it's starting to receive actual liquid to the, uh, the vent. And typically we'll also see the tower start to vent around the same time. Um, the tower vent is a lot more obvious um, even from a distance just because of how high up it is but essentially the same process happens on the tower they have to chill all of the lines going from the base of the tower all the way up to um, the fifth level of the tower where the uh, QD arm is so that, uh, that'll be one of the signs we're looking for once they're um, preparing to load the ship um, but the there's obviously far more propellant that's needed for the booster than the ship so um, typically we'll see them start to fill the booster first and then start to start the ship shortly after that. Um, 
But uh, yeah, as we can see, the venting is getting even heavier now. It's tough to tell because we're a little bit zoomed out right here. I can't tell if the launch mount is still going, but it looks like it is. Well, and, uh, it, the sorry to cut you off. Much, set. much heavier right now. They are, and we do have another update from SpaceX who says that they are go for prop load, but as we talked about earlier in the broadcast, as far as the wind level that was gusting up to 25 miles per hour, uh, they're keeping an eye on the winds, and they have now adjusted the T0 once again, currently targeting 8.25 a.m. Central, that is 9.25 a.m. Eastern, 13.25 UTC. So we are adjusting our countdown clock accordingly to that, as you can see here. Now at T minus 58 minutes, 37 seconds and counting. So fueling has not actually begun yet, according to this latest current timeline. SpaceX has a 110 minute window, so just shy of two hours. So that puts it at 8.50 would be the end of the window for today. So we'll see. Oh, we now if have they... the tower venting. Yep. So certainly good signs that the lines are being conditioned for the start of fueling. Sort of analogous to the big vent that we would see from the feed lines for a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy rocket that comes before upper stage locks load. Presume, Zach, that it's a fairly similar process to what we're seeing here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the Falcon 9 for loading process, but they are, I mean, given that they're using cryogenics, it's definitely going to be pretty similar. Um, you want to make sure the propellant loading lines are as cold as possible so that you're not sending gas into the tanks, uh, basically just for reduces how much venting you have to do inside of the tanks um, and really just want to get it as cold as possible. So in order to do that, you have to actually also have the pipes as cold as possible too. So basically what you're seeing is the um, liquid oxygen boiling off inside of those propellant lines. Um, and as I said before, as it gets closer to receiving actual liquid to those vents, you'll see that cloud get larger and larger and larger. Um, and actually, as the cloud's getting larger, it's also kind of a sign of how far up the tower the actual liquid level is inside of the, uh, the pipes. So as you can see right now, it's slowly getting heavier. Um, and eventually, we'll probably see that cloud reach a point where it actually ends up touching the ground. It'll be so large. That's certainly pretty impressive. I hope this T0 time doesn't change again. <laughs> well, we certainly hope not, but, you know, the winds will do what the winds will do, I suppose. Speaking of which, uh, they're kind of picking up a little bit here, and the marine layer is coming in thicker than it was earlier, and that was the phrase I was looking for, marine layer. Um, but, yeah, it's not great for visibility here. We were hoping it would be a little bit clearer than this. Uh, we could even see the stars for most of the night last night. So that uh, that kind of puts a damper on things, at least from our viewing angle, but we'll still feel it and see all the light coming from it. It's just not all the uh, uh, direct light will be pretty scattered here. So I'm hoping uh, things still clear up and everything's go. We got to do a launch and get these uh, these tests done because the next ones are uh, coming on the line. Uh, so. Yeah, before we talk about sort of what's coming next down the pipe, just want to put a, a pin on the, the weather side of things, just looking at my weather widget here. Uh, right now, winds are about 18 miles per hour in the area of South Padre Island, which is just a little bit north of uh, Starbase, of course, with gusts of most recently 27 miles per hour. And as Stephen mentioned a little bit earlier in the broadcast, uh, SpaceX hasn't disclosed a lot of information about the wind tolerance of Starship at lift off and during flights so that's a unfortunately a little bit of an unknown at this point we certainly hope that there'll be more 
uh, forthcoming with information on that just so we're all better informed and we can do this reporting work with a little more authority as concerns the the wind elements of it all uh but to zach and, and thomas and you know, Stephen, I'll, I'll bring you back in, in in just a second here but as we've been watching this particular starship integrated vehicle obviously we saw ship 25 going through some recent testing and there's much more that is out of frame from this camera point of view that's happening at Starbase. Give folks for those who have not had an opportunity to get down there an idea of what's happening on the production and, and testing side here at Starbase. Obviously, they've they've always got Raptor engine tests at various stages of work, but you know, where are we looking at as far as the next iteration of, of ship and super heavy? Um, well, well I, I think um, right now, like even more important than the ships is the actual just testing process itself. So um, we know that they are preparing to start the second launch tower at the um, actual launch site. Uh, so that'll be really awesome seeing two integration towers um, in this view. And uh, in order to do that, they kind of have to move all of their suborbital testing away from um, the launch pad. So the, there's kind of double reason to do that. I think um, had they been able to build on the land that they initially planned to, which would be to the left of this view um, into the wetlands, I think they may potentially have left that suborbital site where it is. Um, but, you know, the other part of it is reducing the amount of beach closures that they have. So every time they do a cryo test or spin prime or static fire test of a ship, they have to shut down the beach. Um, and by moving that to another location, which is, uh, well, Thomas, you can give me the exact mileage probably. <laughs> but so, if I recall, it's like four miles. Yeah, that's ish. what I was trying to guess. Four, four miles down the road. Um, so they, they've already moved all of their cryo testing for boosters and ships over to the uh, Massey's test site. And currently they're in the process of constructing a large flame trench, which will allow them to do static fire tests of the ship um, at that site as well too. So they're in the process of doing that. They've kind of framed out the actual flame, flame trench and also started to construct the um, base that the ship will sit on top of. Um, and more, most recently, RGV aerial flyovers we've seen um, they, they've actually al already started delivering the what will later be the um, water deluge system it's actually very similar to a lot of water deluge systems that you'll find on uh, any launch pads with flame trench it's like a basically form a ramp um, and it's going to be really cool once they finished it so they're, they're making a lot of progress on it and we don't really know what will be the last time they do a static fire test at the launch site. And I think that'll kind of be a sad day because we've all gotten used to being able to see the ship static fires um, kind of, you know, from these up close views, but that's going to go away pretty soon. I've actually was expecting that we would probably see ship 29 to perform a static fire before this launch. Um, but they ended up only performing the uh, spin prime test. So uh, I think they just wanted to get everything away from the launch site as quickly as possible so that they could, uh, move on to this um, flight three. But yeah, that's one of the big things we're going to see coming in the future is all ship testing um, being at that Massey site. And um, as far as vehicles go, um, hmm. well, we are looking at, I think, what is there, four, uh, four ships left of this design. So this is um, what they refer to as version one and version two should be coming soon. We've actually not really seen too much hardware for that new version of ship, um, but they will be stretching the ship. Um, I don't know if Elon confirmed whether or not they're going to move the flaps yet, um, but they claim that it's going to be a lot lighter. I'm not sure how that's going to be possible since they're actually stretching the ship, um, but that's going to be one of the biggest changes that we're going to see in the near future is with the ship. I don't know if they're really planning to make any major changes with the booster coming up, but we will see them uh, integrate the uh, newer version of the Raptor soon, which has significantly higher thrust. So 
I think that alone is a major change to the booster once they actually reach that point. We're not sure which booster will be the first one to um, to have those engines. I mean, it could be on booster 11 or 12, but that's something we're going to be seeing here soon. Um, there's a ton of there's a ton of upgrades with the ship. It's kind of hard to just list all of them out. The Ring Watchers have done some really great articles talking about what's new on the current version of the ship. Um, but as far as what we're going to see on version two, uh, it's kind of one of those things we just have to wait wait on because we haven't seen too much hardware for it yet. Well, and speaking believe... of waiting, uh, just before you jump in here, Thomas, uh, we don't have to wait on the start of propellant load since we do have word from SpaceX that fueling on ship upper stage is now finally officially underway. So that is good news for hopefully seeing a launch in T minus 48 minutes, 38 seconds in counting. Although based off of what we learned the last go around, SpaceX does have the ability to hold once they've started fueling before they launch. So they do have a little bit of wiggle room on the back end of this window, unlike a Falcon 9 or a Falcon Heavy launch where once they've started fueling, they're committing to that current T0. Uh, Starship has a little bit more latitude as far as that's concerned. All right, Thomas, go ahead. I was going to say uh, about the stretching the ship, uh, but that was all good news. I was very welcome to that news. Um, the the uh, version 3 was that looked like that was the one that would be stretched. So version 2 is going to be lighter. Version 3 uh, would be heavier, obviously, but they would basically be strategically lightening the version 2 ships. Um, and so they uh, looked at, or Elon's t talked about a couple of different numbers. There was 150 meters, which was like a percentage, which was weird. Uh, that would be we put the booster in the ship even larger than they are now. You'd have to be basically have them both the same. That never works out um, as far as what they have for the mega base. So it really is like 135 meters is what we could be looking at stretching them to. And the, the big obvious one is the uh, orbital depot. That's the particular one that we would see the stretch for. And then we'd also probably see that stretch applied to other uh, ships such as perhaps uh, uh, tankers or even just the cargo capacity in volume that Starship can have uh, is that stretched uh, capability. So there's quite a few different reasons to do it. I'm uh, excited to see when they will will make the world's largest rocket even bigger. Yeah, it's a, it's a little astounding SpaceX's ability to surmount and surpass its own record. That is sort of the the name of the game for them. Obviously we're watching, you know, a number of large launch vehicles that are either flying or in flight now. Uh we did fortunately get to see ULA's Vulcan rocket lift off earlier this year carrying a moonbound mission. They're gonna get ready to fly again uh potentially as soon as late April, early May, depending on the readiness of Sierra Space's Dream Chaser spacecraft and the readiness of the Vulcan rocket, of course, as well to launch for a second time. And then, you know, we've all been watching the progress on Blue Origin's New Glenn rocket down at LC-36, which has gone through a number of cryogenic testing. Uh, Steven, want to bring you in just if you want to speak to, you know, some of the the, the big uh, big launch vehicle family um, that we're now sort of seeing come into their own in this era now that we've got Starship going for its third flight, uh, Vulcan preparing for its second, New Glenn coming up on its first. Hey, Will, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah, all of these rockets uh, were kind of unveiled and uh, re announced around the same time frame in the middle of the last decade. And uh, we're now seeing them all come to fruition. Uh, you mentioned the Vulcan debut back in January. I believe New Glenn, the first launch, 
uh, could be late summer, early fall. Uh, I've heard uh, various sources either August or October for the first New Glenn launch, uh, which will be carrying a couple of satellites uh, for NASA to Mars. So they have a fairly narrow planetary window to meet, and uh, that is in the uh, late summer, early fall time frame. And uh, we'll see how many launches uh, Starship uh, accomplishes this year. Elon has mentioned maybe around a half dozen or so. Uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, a few more or a few uh, less uh, Starship launches, depending on how today goes. So I think uh, uh, you know the number of Starships we see this year really depends on the outcome of today's test flight. Yes, we are at a T minus 43 minutes, 38 seconds and counting. So yes, uh, the propellant load process is moving along very smoothly at this point, it appears. Yeah, good to see uh, Super Heavy now receiving its turn on liquid oxygen. Uh, question for Thomas, I suppose. And, and Zach, if you'd like to, to jump in as well after that, given the comparatively fast turnaround time for flight three of Starship, you know, compared to the, the distance between Falcon one and uh, Falcon nine from their flights two to three and the, the, how well the infrastructure around the pad seemed to stand up from the last attempt assuming we do see a fully successful flight profile which recognizes you know uh potentially a tall order here but let's say that all goes as well as spacex hope it does today do you think that based off of what's available at starbase right now both from a hardware readiness as well as uh pad support readiness that an additional you know five or so launches this year is within the realm of possibility given uh, the FAA's clearance of you know such operations. Well, so the operations physical path, uh, capability that's still going to be in question, but the thing that we've seen most recently is they have at least uh, either improved or, or repaired uh, what was going on with the OLM as of the last flight. So there's this maneuver that uh, has been called the uh, pad avoidance maneuver or tower avoidance maneuver, sorry. <laughs> you'd also want to avoid the pad too <laughs> for sure but yeah they uh they've basically reinforced it uh with uh, additional stainless steel and everything else there uh closer to the qd area uh, yeah so we got uh somebody mentioning there's a chill line on the, the starship itself you can see it on the the video there <laughs> so we got uh quite a bit of improvements um on the, uh, the the vehicle as well as the infrastructure that should help in reducing that uh, that cycle, but we are going to see some of the changes that they will need to make to increase that tempo. So right now the vehicle is disposable; it'll have to become refurbishable, and then it will become reusable uh, after all, all the tests and everything else is complete. But those are big stages to get. Right now, Falcon Nine is way past the refurbishable stage it is in the reusable stage it's in the airline industry that uh, uh i've heard uh fellow uh, commentators here have talked about like tail numbers and things um the uh it, the, the 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 promise of starship is the same in that that it's so oftenly used as a uh, a vehicle that you can kind of put it that of that attributable like nice direction of saying it's going to be the airline industry ready. You basically do some preventative maintenance, check out some things, and fly it again. Um, right now, the coking thing is a, an issue with Falcon 1, or Falcon 9. Um, technically, Falcon 1, if it was reopens, would be as well, because it had the Merlin, but... <laughs> um, anyways, the whole system is uh, going in that very positive direction of reusability. So, Zach, uh, you probably have more in-depth details on the infrastructure. Want to jump into that before we move on. Uh, so the question was uh, the infrastructure, uh, it was basically the infrastructure changes for reusability of this vehicle. Uh, 
the vehicle itself, but also the pad instructor. And you're stage zero, Zach. So you can definitely jump on that one. Before you do jump in here, Zach, just want to note what I think you were having your eyes on that we're seeing now frost rings start to form around the super heavy booster as locks load continues on and looks like we're seeing a similar thing on the ship upper stage as well so getting some good visual signs that the tanks are being filled and we're stepping towards it um but it, it sounds like uh thomas and, and steven was just mentioning on a, a back channel that you can see this shot from the raptor ranch that it's still quite windy out there Yep, it's it's very windy over in this direction. It's coming and going, but uh, visibility a bit better than it was earlier. So the uh, uh, can't remember the marine layer here is very spotty at best. I, I get a little bit of daylight coming through, and then it uh, disappears, and then it comes back full like blue sky for a good patch. <laughs> so it's just the marine layer that's the the big issue here. Zach, I didn't mean to cut you off. You can go ahead. Er before flight one they added a ton of shielding on the inside edge of the launch mount to basically protect the hold down arms and the inner edge of the launch mount they put um, what we refer to as burn plates um, basically uh, detachable plates that they're able to weld on the inside of it that um, basically gave it a little bit more durability for handling thermal loads um, and also allowed them like, you know, if they actually damage the inner edge of the launch mount to just replace those. Um, but after this, after flight two, it seems like they removed a lot of that. Um, and they never ended up replacing it. We kind of thought at first that, you know, wow, this got damaged this much over. But uh, they removed a lot of that shielding and uh, never ended up replacing it. So it seems like they've realized that it wasn't necessary. Um, and even on the hold down arms, I think um, that stuff they also realized wasn't necessary. The hold down arms really don't um, receive too much contact with the, the exhaust plume. So um, I think once they passed the phase of testing where they were worried about engine explosions, um, they realized they were able to remove some of that stuff and kind of lighten the actual system a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how necessary it was, but removing all that shielding from the hold down arms allows them to probably retract a little bit faster than they would otherwise. Um, so that's one thing that they've done um, since the last flight. And we know that um, with the second integration tower, their plan basically is to um, get the second tower up and running and once they do that, they'll switch operations over to that launch pad, the second uh, pad two, and then they'll basically upgrade the first pad. So that's going to be interesting to see. Um, it's tough to uh, guess what changes are going to be made on the second launch tower, but uh, we do know that they'll have shorter chopsticks like they do at the pad in, at um, 39A. Um, and other than that, we don't really know a lot of what they're going to do as far as upgrades to it. Um, but as far as re reusability goes, sorry, I'm, I'm like thinking as I'm going here, it's uh, been a long day. I'm going on like hour 28 of being awake. Um, uh, I think we may actually potentially see them add additional water deluge to the top surface of the launch mount. Um, so that is one thing that they have had to replace is the um, also burn plates that are on the top of the launch mount. And those receive a lot of direct contact with the exhaust plume, especially with the pad avoidance maneuver. So every area that they've, that that flame has contacted um, in the last, uh, actually just after the last launch, they replaced a lot of those plates on the top of the launch mount. So. I think um, that kind of work is things are is something that they won't want to do in the future. 
So they're going to have to come up with something that allows them to not have to do that kind of refurbishment every time. So I think that'll be one of the big changes that is related to rapid reusability of the actual pad. And man, that frost level is climbing really fast. And love how uh, quick this propellant loading process is now. I mean, it's really amazing because you're basically loading um, 10 times, was it 10 times the amount of uh, fuel on a Falcon 9 in about the same time? Yeah, so a, a Falcon 9 has about a million pounds of propellant. So yeah, 10x on uh, Starship here and about the same fueling timeline as a Falcon Heavy rocket. So the actual prop load starts at about T minus, uh, I was actually just looking this up the other day, it was about 30 or about 50 minutes out from liftoff of a Falcon Heavy is when uh, prop load begins, which is pretty much on par with where things are now with Starship. So come a long way since IFT2 now to this fueling timeline. And as we are just now seeing that uh, SpaceX is getting going with its broadcast, we should be getting some additional camera feeds that we may be able to weave in and out of our own between Lab Padre and Spaceflight now. As far as mission audio, it's going to be a little bit of a, a dance between uh, true mission audio updates, which we certainly want to bring you and just additional uh, SpaceX commentary on their own. So we'll go ahead and, and keep our conversation going. But of course, as we hear relevant callouts and updates on fueling, health of the vehicle, um, guys in the back, if they do start talking about uh, weather briefing, though, or status of the weather, uh, let's go ahead and, and take that audio and, and visual as well, just so we're all sort of abreast with where things currently stand. That'd be great. We're now T-minus 32 minutes, nine seconds and counting, though. The next fueling milestone we're going to be coming upon here shortly is at T-minus 19 minutes and 40 seconds. That's when the Raptor chill-down sequence begins on both the booster and the ship. It involves flying a, some liquid oxygen through the plumbing and turbo pumps, similar to a Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, and protects them from the risk of thermal shock and damage during the startup sequence. Yeah, this aerial view from the drone is pretty awesome. Um, you can really get an idea of how large that uh, vapor plume is at the at the uh, tank farm. Sorry, there, Zach. I was just uh, balancing some audio things on on my side behind the scenes, just making sure we can monitor what's going on with the SpaceX feed and. Things are sounds like pretty raucous at at Hawthorne as they're getting ready to launch this third integrated flight test. I think we're really going to be relying on the uh, aerial footage a lot today. Hopefully, they um, what is it the WB fifty seven? I'm not sure if they actually the launch last time. I think they have another, they must have another aerial asset up there, but hopefully they'll be able to get above that cloud layer. Yeah. I mean, you can really see in this um, drone view here, just the, the thickness of the cloud layer here. 
Well, that's I, got, I got some good news on that. The marine layer uh, that's coming in towards uh, Starbase or to the ship here is getting better uh, as far as visibility. I can see blue skies above it. A few clouds here and there, but uh, it's it's at least looking to be a fairly clear launch uh, as long as uh, we don't get a marine haze layer behind the uh, clear skies here. We'll keep watching. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Thomas. And yeah, just taking a look at the wind situation, looks like winds are still about 18 miles per hour, gusts about 27 miles per hour. So that'll continue to be a, a watch item and unless or until they're able to move forward here. Taking a look at one of our other camera vantage points, it's still a, a bit hazy as, as the fellows have been saying from some vantage points. But you can see, you can kind of make out the Starship rocket and, and support tower there. A little bit of light at the top there. But certainly not what you would call exactly a Chamber of Commerce kind of a day for a, a Starship launch. But as we've been talking about through the broadcast, obviously the, the most important thing from SpaceX's perspective is not to get good publicity pictures, but rather get the intel and the data and make sure that they can move past this launch and continue on with their flight cadence. Stephen, to bring you back in here, um, you know, we've been talking throughout the broadcast about the iterative approach of SpaceX and, and Starship and some of the lessons that they're hoping to learn here. Um, you know, now that we're coming in the final 30 minutes, uh, I know we've got quite a few more folks who are joining us now live who were not with us before. So want to make sure everyone gets caught up to speed in the last 30 minutes. First off, before I let you go ahead and take over for a second, I uh, just want to make sure for those who are joining us freshly new in this final 30 minutes, first off, welcome aboard to live coverage of the third integrated flight test of SpaceX's Starship vehicle. Will Robinson-Smith joined by a wonderful panel of guests in this joint coverage between Lab Padre and Space Flight Now. With us today are Stephen Clark from Ars Technica, Zach Golden with CSI Starbase, and Thomas, a mainstay here at Lab Padre as well. So as we are just pivoting, uh, Stephen, they've got a number of flight objectives that are pushing the bounds of what Starship has done on its first two previous flights. For those who were not with us when we talked about some of those mission milestones, give us just a brief overview of some of the uh, boxes that they're hoping to tick today. Yeah, so Will, um, I think the big thing SpaceX wants to achieve today is to get through the entire flight profile. They want to get Starship uh, on the trajectory to take it to the Indian Ocean. I think getting there would be a big win. Obviously, there are additional objectives that they want to achieve. They, those include the opening and closing of the payload bay door. That's a key demonstration before they can uh, put on uh, Starlink satellites on future Starship flights, uh, potentially, potentially this year. And uh, the other big test is the tank-to-tank -tank cryogenic transfer. So they're gonna be transferring liquid oxygen, several tons of liquid oxygen between uh, the main tank and a header tank on the uh, Starship in microgravity. That'll be a first. Uh, that'll be the largest scale cryogenic transfer of propellant ever conducted in microgravity. However, it's just a, a very small fraction of the hundreds of tons of uh, cryogenics that they will need to uh, transfer between ships on future flights, uh, potentially, especially those flights for Artemis, uh, the human landing system, to carry astronauts uh, to and from the lunar surface. Those will require uh, much more uh, massive amounts of cryogenic transfer. And the other key test that they want to get today will be the relight of a Raptor engine to uh, essentially it'll be a deorbit burn. It'll just slightly alter the trajectory of Starship uh, and move the splashdown zone from one part of the Indian Ocean to another. 
uh, that test uh, will last probably a few seconds to uh, put in about uh, 100 meters per second of delta V or velocity change. And so those are the three main objectives for this flight once they get into space, once they complete the ascent of Starship. But I think uh, making progress from IFT2, getting through the entire Starship burn, getting the vehicle on a trajectory uh, to take it all the way to the Indian Ocean would be uh, what I would count as a step forward and a good uh, foundation to build on for Starship. So uh, any uh, any issue before then, uh, you know, engine failures or an issue during hot staging, I don't, I don't expect that since they demonstrated that on IFT2. But if they did encounter that, that would uh, I'd probably... Uh, require some uh, redesign or, or a little more time waiting before the next flight of Starship. Yeah. To uh, Stephen's point there, Zach, as we're now T minus 23 minutes, 40 seconds and counting, um, obviously getting through the full flight profile is of you know high importance to SpaceX. How, not that we're expecting this by any means, but how big of an impact or a setback would it be if, for whatever reason, hot staging did not work this time as it did last go around? Um, well, I think the probability of hot staging being worse than last time is probably pretty low. Um, but, you know, obviously booster reusability is a very high priority for them, but I think the ship reaching orbit um, might be slightly higher. Uh, I mean, especially when you consider the fact that they've had full TPS tiles installed on, um, you know, ship 20, 24, 25, um, and they've never actually gotten to test them yet. Um, so I think being able to finally reach that milestone of being able to test that thermal protection system is going to be very important. Um, but, you know, I would say reusability of the booster would be second to that. Um, but I think as long as it doesn't explode after uh, stage separation, like it did last time, that's going to be a mark of improvement. Um, I think, uh, it's going to be a lot more likely that we'll actually see a, a soft touchdown of the booster this time. Um, Honestly, that's the thing I'm looking forward to most, although I do think, as I said, that the performance of the ship is slightly more important. And and just briefly, why is that in your mind? Um, well, I think that's the part that a lot of people have the most question about, um, that thermal protection system. Like, is it enough to actually um, allow them to reenter safely? Uh, you know, are they going to be able to launch this and get off the pad without having tiles rain down from the ship again like it did last time um you know i think all of those questions are really important to answer and um you know i guess as far as performing its mission in orbit like being able to um uh dispense payloads and actually you know getting closer to their artemis um goals i, I guess maybe reentry isn't as important but overall, for their mission, you know, to go to Mars, the reentry on the ship is going to be very, very important. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, what are you guys' opinions on that? I, I personally think reentry is definitely what they are striving for on this one. Yeah, I would. Uh, before we go ahead and get Thomas's thoughts on that, I would say I I, I would agree that reentry is going to be a key marker on that. Well, we're uh, sharing, Steve and I are sharing the mic at the moment. Uh, it's really windy and noise canceling drives havoc on things. So, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with the, those assessments about the ship being the biggest priority because I think once they can demonstrate the ship and get to orbit, even if the transfer doesn't work, the prop transfer, the relay, um, I think the payload bay door test is probably the least exotic, the least risky of those demonstrations between the relight and the transfer. So if they can get into orbit and demonstrate the doors open, we could see Starlinks flying on potentially the next starship or the one after that. 
and uh, they can really start building out uh, the direct to sell network of Starlink and uh, expanding that, rolling it out a lot faster than they can with Falcon 9 alone. So I think getting ship into orbit, they can put payloads on Starship going forward. And even those flights with payloads, once they deploy Starlinks, they can continue with the ship in orbit uh, to experiment with prop transfer and reentry and things of that sort. But uh, getting to orbit, opening the doors unlocks uh, the ability to launch satellites going forward. So just want to jump in here as we're seeing uh, from the SpaceX feed, seeing green across the board on the range and the weather side so far. Uh, they note that they're still watching the wind and the weather, but you can see the propellant load process there on the left-hand side of your screen, a good fuel gauge. Uh, the commentators, as you were talking, Stephen mentioned, they were about 80% full uh, sort of across the board when you equal everything out, but you can see the individual percentage breakdowns there on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, liquid methane, about 83% filled. Liquid oxygen, 85 on ship. And then uh, liquid methane on booster, 62% liquid oxygen on booster 65%. So great to see uh, some of these fueling milestones. Um, it'd be great actually if they just kept this <laughs> graphic up the whole time and uh, we just got a, a real time fuel gauge of this uh, process. But you can see also at the bottom left hand corner of your screen, um, the wind gauge there, 31 uh, kilometers per hour. It's been sort of fluctuating in the low 30s, upper 20s. Uh, temp of 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, if it's just a, a vacation or a beach day for you, it's, you know, not too terrible. Um, but as far as uh, launching a Starship launch vehicle, that is the, the the question. As the commentator just used the word marginal as far as the winds are concerned. So keep an eye on that. Is there enough T-minus... Uh, 17 minutes 29 seconds and counting they've gone through the process of the raptor chill down so far so now really just the thing that we're watching is the completion of prop load on booster 10 and ship 28 at this point so they said the countdown so far has been fairly clean at this point in the fueling process and the reason for the launch time adjustments, as we've stated throughout the broadcast, have been largely due to making sure that the range is clear and that the boats are out of their keep-out zone. And lastly, they mentioned that they are not working any issues currently with a uh, ship or super heavy booster. So from a technical perspective, it sounds like things are on track for the launch so far at this point and the winds are just kind of the the hanging chad to pull from a florida reference looks like um engine <clears throat> engine chill venting on the booster has started that's good to see and more good news the marine uh layer is looking really good it's nice and clear so you know, 15 minutes, 60 minutes from now, looking really good. That is an excellent update. Thanks to you both on that. Getting a nice view of the 33 Raptor engines as we were just talking about the engine chill sequence. And obviously, throughout the history of Starship, they've gone through, you know, a number of processes with the engines themselves and the control systems for that. Uh, Zach, if you want to talk a little bit about the change to the engine, uh, the actuator system, um, that's a little bit different this time around versus uh, IFT2. Um, well, I think on the, so on the booster, they actually had, um, the electric TVC was first introduced on booster, um, nine. And, um, now they have also integrated that onto the ship as well, too. So this is the first time booster or sorry, ship 28 is the first ship with that electric TVC. 
Um, I think for the most part with the engines on the booster, everything is pretty much the same from the last flight. Um, not too many changes there, but the ship is probably the big upgrade um, as far as now incorporating that electric TVC. I did have a good view showing those um, engines on the booster a bit ago. I wish they would switch back to that so we can talk about some of that stuff. Um, they actually have a really good view showing the engine shell vents on the booster. Um, but uh, if they slide back to that view, well, I think I'll mention it there. Yeah, that sounds great. So we're now T minus 14 minutes, six seconds in counting. So we're getting right down to it. Do want to mention one other additional thing um, from SpaceX's Dan Hote, um said that uh, they may, as we've seen uh, before, they may have to hold at T minus 40 seconds to recheck the winds. As talked about a little bit earlier, they uh, do have the ability to hold for, I think the outer limit is and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I, I think if I remember correctly from IFT2, they have, what, 40 minutes that they can conceivably hold if they had that much time left in the window? I'm not sure on that one, but, uh, you know, I think that that time may have actually increased. Um, I could be wrong on this, but I think uh, the amount of heating that you would have of the actual propellant in the tanks is, is kind of what you're worried about. So you want it to stay as cold as possible. Um, and the longer you sit there, the more it warms up and starts to expand. And uh, I think with the faster propellant loading process, it actually gives them more time to um, hold if they need to. So uh, if, I, if I had to guess, if it was 40 minutes before, it may have increased to 90 minutes now, but I could be wrong about that. It's just speculation, really. Gotcha. Certainly want to think as we continue to come into the final 10 minutes of the count, just around the corner here, I uh, want to thank all of our moderators and camera operators, tech folks working behind the scenes to make this live stream possible. So really appreciate that. Don't want to let everything go by before give you some ups. If you haven't already and you're watching on either this Lab Padre or the Space Flight Now stream, wherever you're watching it, be sure to give a like to this video, help this live coverage be brought to more folks as we come into the final 10 minutes of the countdown plan today and if you haven't already be sure to subscribe to both space flight now and lab padre there's great coverage across both channels and avenues and also just to make sure that our, our guests are not left out if you're not already readers of rs technica they do a lot of great reporting both technical issues that are going to block us to a launch our t0 time still holding to 8 25 a.m central so just about 11 and a half minutes from now uh the real thing we're going to keep an eye on is the winds once we get there we do have that potential hold at t minus 40 seconds where we can hang out and either let winds die down make sure we're in the right structural limits everything like that uh so don't be surprised if we do a hold at t minus 40 we've done those on previous flights uh, but we are not tracking any technical issues. The range is going to be green for launch, so all that really great news. Uh, we're still loading propellant on the vehicle, on the ship. We're just about done loading the header tanks, the two smaller tanks in the top. Uh, and then we'll go back to the main tanks are about 85% full. And then booster, both fuel and locks over 80%. Um, so looking good there. Uh, the launch pad itself is so getting ready for lift off. We commanded the booster the hold downs broadcast. open already uh, about 20 minutes ago or so. Uh, and then that just means that once that rocket has sufficient thrust to overcome its weight, your thrust to weight ratio goes over one, it's going to lift off. Uh, we don't have a command to actually release the hold downs once it starts up. Uh, just also a reminder, actual liftoff happens a few seconds after you see those engines ignite. So you'll see fire and then a few seconds before Starship really starts to take to the skies. Uh, our range team just going to keep on making sure land, sea, air are all clear as we really count down. But that's the latest. 
We're just coming up on 10 minutes before launch. Everything looking good for Starship's third test flight. I'll toss it back to you guys in Hawthorne. And that was SpaceX's Dan Hope, formerly with NASA, giving us an update on sort of where things stand with the mission as we're now T minus nine minutes, and 31 seconds and counting. So all good updates. And as you heard, they may hold at uh, T minus 40 seconds, as we mentioned. But as you can see in the live views here, starting to see some peaks of blue amid the clouds here. So as we heard from Thomas and Stephen, things are starting to look a little bit more picturesque here at Starbase. And hopefully if they are able to launch today, if the winds permit, they'll get some good views and good pictures for everyone in the area. Here's a, a dual view now thanks to some SpaceX aerial assets, a little bit higher up. Also like to mention uh, good news here, even if it does scrub uh, today, is that uh, we will have at least a flight profile limit that we will know they will never fly under as far as winds. Uh, so that's always a benefit of being able to do these tests and see what they do and how they react with the, the weather. But uh, so far, they said they were green across the board. I'm looking at the clouds again. It's looking even better. Uh, there's a bit of upper level haze now, but it's still pretty clear uh, in seven minutes. Uh, it'll be an interesting view from uh, the ship as well as uh, the booster. I hope they, uh, they provide those. So it's going to be a really uh, amazing launch. I'm pretty sure we're still going here because it, it really hasn't changed here on the ground much in the upper level. Just visuals look good. Got any more information on that? Uh, uh, it would be good to pull those up. But yeah, it looks, it, it sounds pretty good so far. Yep, that's all great to hear. And as we're coming into the last seven and a half minutes, want to take a look back at the YouTube Super Chat. Thanks some more folks for supporting the work of the teams here at Lab Padre and Space Flight now. Thanks to Nelson Reyes for a very generous $50 super chat. Really appreciate that, Nelson, who says, uh, great job, Will, the Space Flight Now team. And I will extend that out to all the folks at Lab Padre, as well as our wonderful panel of Stephen Clark, Zach Golden, and Thomas. Aerospace Rocketry with another $5 super chat. Really appreciate that, Aerospace Rocketry. Got a two uh, pound super chat uh, here from Richard D. Uh, Packable. Appreciate the support there. Stephen Ross with a very generous $20 super chat. Thank you, Stephen. Who says, thank you for all you do. So thanks to all of the, the fellas helping to make this coverage possible. Christopher Sen with a 10 euro super chat as well. Just showing a little bit of support. Thank you for that, Christopher. Got Daniel Shea joining us from San Diego, who says, thanks for your coverage and all the awesome videos. Thank you, Daniel, for supporting our diverse teams here and making this all possible. And last for now, before we jump back into the conversation, apologies for probably mispronouncing this, Tanasha Popkan IB with a $5 super chat. Really appreciate that support. We're now T minus five minutes, 26 seconds. We're going to listen to SpaceX for an update. Thanks, Shiva. We're looking good. Five minutes, 35 seconds, and we're counting down. We are just about at uh, closing the prop load sequences on booster and ship. Just a reminder, ship, we're going to close out at around 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Booster at about 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, once all of that prop is loaded on board, we'll have about 10 million pounds of propellant on both stages uh, of Starship. 
Now, after that happens, we'll go through a couple of different procedures with the ground. We'll do what's called pushbacks, clearing out the lines between our prop farm now, and the vehicles that happens, themselves before we'll we get to launch. Uh, and then the in the next few minutes, we'll get the final guidance system alignments, some final thrust vector control on the booster checks. Uh, and all that will be performed. And again, if we need to hold, we have a hold gate built in at T minus 40 seconds where we can hang out. Uh, it sounds like today we'll have about 15 minutes to hold at T minus 40 if we need to. Uh, if we hit that right now, it looks like the most likely reason would be winds. We're not tracking any technical issues to our T zero at 825, just about four and a half minutes from now. So, I mean, everything's really looking good. The, the booster's almost at full frosty so we'll see that close out in just a couple of minutes but we are we're getting really close to flight guys the excitement is definitely growing So some good updates from SpaceX and it sounds like things are moving well. And Zach uh, asking you shall receive. We've got the Raptor engines back if you want to take it from here. Prior to T minus 40 seconds. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you can see kind of on the edges of the launch mount, there's some white frosted pipes. Um, those ones, those are what are basically connected to those Raptor engines. And that's basically uh, collecting the liquid oxygen boil off from the engines as they go through the chill down process. And as that happens, the uh, pipes get frosted and um, that is diverted to a pond that is um, like a collection pond that is behind the integration tower in this view. Um, I think they'll probably show an aerial view again here in a minute and then you'll be able to actually see that liquid oxygen pond. Um, but uh, yeah, th that's one of the things that I think in the future, they're probably going to want to do away with uh, or change somehow so that it's not that type of uh, um, connection, I guess, where it's uh, connected to the outside of the vehicle and it actually rips away once they lift off of the pad. Um, but I think that's one of the upgrades that we will actually see on the newer launch mount once they um, have that constructed. Here, two minutes and 30 seconds away. I think one of the things that we will end up having happen is that the launch countdown will be about 30 seconds delayed from what is actually happening on this feed. Yeah, I was just looking at our countdown clock versus SpaceX's. Uh, it's about 10-ish, maybe 12 seconds apart. Uh, do have word from SpaceX that prop load is complete as we are now less than two minutes away from the planned liftoff of Starship. Again, there could be a hold at T minus 40 seconds, so we'll be keeping a close eye out for that. Uh, just want to briefly mention that as we were been talking a little bit earlier about, you know, what we're looking for with this flight and what's important uh, from this flight profile, uh, someone very much in the know is uh, Lars Blackmore. He's the senior principal Mars landing engineer for SpaceX. He just uh, posted to X saying that um, they're, if they can survive hypersonic entry, uh, we know from our suborbital hops that we can take the ship the rest of the way to landing. So it sounds like he, like us, are, are looking for that re-entry and the, the proof in the pudding of the heat shield for Starship and those tiles. Now will they withstand the re-entry? So we're currently... About 40 seconds away from the planned liftoff of Starship. Again, we may hit a hold because we're a little bit ahead of the SpaceX timeline. So we're listening to the audio from SpaceX. Got the call to grow for launch. So if our countdown clock is right, we should be about four seconds away from liftoff. 
Got the engine ignition. Yes, indeed. Raptors igniting. And we have liftoff. Liftoff of Starship on its third integrated flight test. Ship 28, booster 10, soaring high above southern Texas on the third flight test of a Starship rocket. Got some great tracking views from our team here on the ground. As all 33 Raptor engines are burning now about a minute into flight, coming up on a minute here. And we're getting some onboard camera views here. You can see the hypersonic grid fin Starship continues its climb through the clouds, coming up on a wow. minute and a half into flight. These views are, the onboard views are amazing. Yeah, some great onboard camera views. Just outstanding. Coming up, the next milestone that we're going to be hit is going to be Booster Miko, which in this case stands for Most Engines Cutoff, that's coming up at T plus two minutes, 42 seconds. That'll be followed by the all important hot staging two seconds after that. And then the booster boost back burn start up at T plus two minutes and 55 seconds. Still getting some great tracking views as Starship moves among the clouds. About 20 seconds away from Booster Miko. A couple seconds later, we'll see hot staging. They cut away from on board right before hot staging. And it looks like we've got good hot staging and separation. Oh, wow. And you can see the booster moving away from Starship. That's incredible. It was about this point last time around that we saw the breakup of the super heavy booster. So we'll see if the booster is able to make its way back down toward the Gulf, but you can still see it in the view here from onboard ship 28. So Thomas and Steven, we're gonna be excited to hear from you if you can hear uh, booster 10 making its way back down. I have a feeling it's way too loud for them in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. We got all 10 engines, or sorry, all 13 engines um, still active on the booster. So it looks like boost back is going really well. Yep. We just saw another reduction in Raptor engines. And now I've got some uh -oh. dual onboard camera views here, which is just spectacular. Coming up on three minutes. They cut engines for boost back or if they just lost it. Yeah, I'm listening to see if they make a mention of that. We're now a little over four minutes into flight. That was uh, around the time that the booster boost back burn shutdown was about, you know, planned to occur. Given the fact that we're still getting a speedometer and an altitude monitor, I think booster is still intact. Yeah. Wow. Coming up the next milestone here will be uh, when the booster becomes transonic or slows below the speed of sound. And we'll see the booster landing burn start up at T plus six minutes and 46 seconds. But Zach, I mean, this is 
what we were hoping to see with the ship upper stage. There's a big test here and just some spectacular onboard views that we have not seen from Starship yet. Yeah, this is amazing. I mean, they're basically doing the whole thing on board. That's basically what everybody wanted from the last flight. I, I think a lot of this has to do with um, the, the upgraded Starlink antenna locations on the ship. And uh, I think that's possibly what's giving them better connection this time. There's a, we, we've been thinking for a while that there's a chance that they just didn't have signal at all from the ship um, during flight two. But oh, okay, we're getting um, some rotation from the booster now. It looks like it should be getting some grid fin action here soon. Yeah, and our cameras oh, man, on the ground here are. This, time. this is going to be amazing. We'll see if our cameras can capture it as it happens. They're they're scanning the skies, and hopefully we'll be able to catch it from the ground, as well as from the onboard cameras. We're now passing six minutes into flight. We're about 30 seconds away oh, from wow. the booster being transonic. Grid fins. Yeah, I get some grid fin actuation there. Nice to see some maneuvering. That booster is making its way back down for what appears to be set up for a, a soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Another big achievement. The 13 center engines are going to ignite and really slam on the brakes. You'll see the speedometer drop much more rapidly. All right, showtime. Whoa. Looks like they have a few engines that have ignited. Whoa. And there that it is. is. That was quite something. Did they lose it? Well, the altitude hit zero, and it looked like the base of the booster was just coming up on the water. So it appears yeah. as though it was intact all the way down, even though I don't think there were 13... Raptors that were ignited as intended. I think it, it should um, usually only be the um, what we were kind of expecting is it would start with thirteen and then drop down to three. Um, so tree is still showing one engine. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Yeah, the the speed of it's the ship is just astounding. Here's a view inside the control room at a star base there. It looks like as the booster was falling down that it was um, uh, a little bit out of control. So what SpaceX just said on, on their comms is that it fell just a little short of their planned relight profile. So yeah, to, to your point, Zach, I think a little loss of control is is what they came into, but certainly much more uh, much more of a complete mission than what they saw last time. I would love to see a view of that thing slamming into the water. And we have Starship engine cutoff. Starship is now coasting, making its way to begin its journey more than halfway around the world. And look at this view here. And we've had a call out for nominal orbital insertion. Now T plus nine minutes, uh, 14 seconds into this flight. So coming up next in just about two minutes and 15 seconds will be when they open the payload door, Zach. So we will see if they're able to give us a, a good view of that. I mean, given the the consistency of, of the feed from onboard ship 28, 
if they've got a camera pointed in the right direction, I think there's there's a good chance we may actually see this. This is crazy. It's very interesting that the ship is still um, sideways. Mm -hmm. is so this as we relight, uh, it shouldn't it be. Should early, right? be. Yeah, no. the The relight's not until about forty minutes into flight. So the next couple of milestones, we'll see the propellant door. Or the, excuse me, the payload door open just a little before 12 minutes. That'll be followed by the prop transfer demo, which obviously we won't see, but that'll begin at T plus 24 minutes and 31 seconds. The door will close at T plus 28 minutes and 21 seconds. And then the relight demo comes up at T plus 40 minutes and 46 seconds. So... all goes well you know it seems like they're on a, a good path to get a lot of great data on prop transfer uh raptor relight opening the payload doors and then of course the re-entry and testing of the heat shield uh if we do have um the other uh members of the panel in there uh steven and, and thomas i don't know if you can still hear us um but if you're still with us and able to respond um just want to get your thoughts on the the launch and the mission at this point uh steven we'll start with you and then go to thomas yeah well this was uh a great success i think you can say for spacex this was uh as i mentioned in our discussion before the launch they reached the real oh, hang on, velocity steven. target sorry to cut you off we're now but we seeing did get we did get word that the payload door has opened. So the, the door opening milestone has been accomplished. So that's another box ticked. Next up will be the prop transfer demo, T plus 24 minutes and 31 seconds. So I'm sorry to cut you off. Just wanted to make sure we noted that, but go ahead. Yeah, another milestone. And uh, we'll await the news on the prop transfer demo. And then following that, we should see the payload bay door close. So, uh, but just from what they've accomplished so far uh, with Starship at 185 kilometers altitude, uh, they've reached their orbital velocity target. It looked like all 39 Raptor engines on booster and ship uh, all fire normally, no failures. And, uh, now that they've opened the payload bay door, I would uh, suggest that uh, SpaceX has uh, accomplished all they need to test uh, in order to feel comfortable putting a satellite uh, payload on a Starship, uh, potentially with the next flight. And um, Thomas, if you want to pick it up from there, just your, your thoughts yeah, on the, the mission so far, getting through opening the door. And, you know, now we are... Uh, just about, let's see, where are we in the timeline? Uh, it's T plus 13 minutes and 31 seconds from the SpaceX feed, 13.48 in uh, real time. So we're just about 10 minutes from that prop transfer demo. Um, but yeah, Thomas, your, your thoughts my, on it? My experience so far, there was no time. Like, you cannot focus or pay attention on anything else other than Starship because you blink and you miss about 50 billion things going on. That was intense. Um, the floor was shaking. Your chest is pounding. And you can see that it was in the clouds for good portions of it, but it was spectacular. Um, the uh, <clears throat> uh, interesting thing is that uh, with the, the payload bay door opening, and they've, they've shown it to everybody, it's like we are ready for you know their customers to uh, order their satellites, and those satellites are going to take like two years to make. but. Some customers are already on uh, online or on the path to uh, uh, work with SpaceX directly here. So there is at least going to be a big push for those customers to now move to Starship because for them, it, it's a viable approach. They don't care about the reentry part. That's the cost approach that SpaceX is taking. Um, 
they want to get their payload in orbit and they've just demonstrated that they can do that. So that's a huge part of their business. Absolutely. And I know Zach, we were able to, to chat back and forth, you and I, as, um, you know, as, as, uh, Thomas was just saying, it was exceedingly loud there, both from the noise of the rocket, as well as I'm sure the, the cheering in the area of the Raptor ranch, but, you know, we we saw uh, what appeared to be a mostly successful uh, soft landing of the Booster 10 making its way back down. It sounds like the uh, engine reignition didn't quite work as fully robustly as initially hoped, but certainly a, a, a big another big milestone in that part of the program. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I'm, on that I'm part. super excited right now. This is one of the things I was looking for was to see whether or not the grid fins were actually going to turn during hot staging, and uh, we actually did get a great view of that happening. Oh, that's good to hear. So uh, one thing that I noticed um, that basically was when it was in orbit here, there was a few tiles missing, but it looked a lot better. I wasn't able to get all of the tiles because I was looking at it in real life versus the stream for a bit and. Oh, wow. Inside, this looks amazing. Oh. This looks like it's the LOX tank. Is that right? Uh, Zach, uh, can you confirm that? Um, This looks like the payload section. Wait, uh, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the payload section. It's the door itself. It's closed. Yeah, it's closed. The way that it had the, uh, the the venting for a second there made me think it was the lock section. Uh, they got me. <laughs> so they pressurize the the, the the area as well. Um, that's something that it helps for rigidity on launch, and I'm pretty sure they're going to do it for reentry. So maybe that's without a uh, little bit of a uh, little look like gas in there, like it was the lock tank was all about. So it sounded like they had to open the door but it i mean based off this view i mean that's either not the case or the door has reclosed earlier than anticipated um obviously we're still you know sort of learning in real time as are the you know, the folks in, in hawthorne about you know this vehicle but what do you think this this tells us about this aspect of the mission uh zach um sorry uh can you repeat that Oh, just given the fact that it appears that the payload bay door is closed, suggests that either it did not open or it opened and then closed earlier than we had anticipated it closing. Um, um, did they, what, list, what do you did they say how long it was that? supposed to stay open? So they mentioned on the timeline that it was going to close at T plus 28 minutes and 21 seconds. Oh, so interesting. That's quite a bit earlier if it in fact did open. Yeah. There's a possibility that this angle is kind of throwing things off a little bit. It might actually be open. I see some light on the outside of it. Yeah, so uh, Stephen and I are looking at it too and agree that there it's it's partially open right now. Hmm. Yeah, it may just be the the angle we're seeing it that the door is just yeah, because the the flap op like it pulls up within the the super heavy booster, right? It's not like you know a, a door flap that would you know come open and out towards space. It it kind of slides up from this vantage point. So we may just be at an angle where the size of the payload bay door is just masking the opening of the payload bay. This this onboard camera view during re-entry is going to be incredible. Absolutely. Is that uh, some uh, solid oxygen floating off that I see, or is that uh, <laughs> another tile? <laughs> Could be. Yeah, I can't tell if it's ice or if it's tiles. I can't imagine tiles having a reason to fall off in orbit, though. 
Yeah, as long as there's no moisture in those tiles that's uh, popping them off. Uh, there wasn't any rain recently, so we should be good. But yeah, it's probably just solid oxygen uh, drifting off. That's pretty common with these vehicles in general. Uh, but yeah, earlier I saw one of those and I'm like, it's it's going from dark to light. I think that could be a tile. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably solid oxygen on all of all of those. But you could see uh, there were some missing tiles. The vehicle is going to be going through re-entry. Um, and with a couple of missing tiles, it might be able to survive. But when it's at a large block or section, we'll be able to go through uh, multiple... Uh, pieces of footage from all angles and be able to see at least the the tiles where they're missing the most those are going to be the most the suspect areas uh, of the vehicle but the, it's usually the glue around the bands at least on the previous uh, flights but they went through and did a quite a bit of testing uh for pull testing on the tiles removing one tile at a time to see which ones would stay which ones would go um in order to verify that these are tiles worthy of the uh the vehicle there we go it's back again yeah great to see these onboard views here and just uh speaking of the the tiles that we were talking about it looks like and correct me if i'm wrong or or just not seeing this correctly it looks like there's at least one tile on the uh on the fin there that looked like it was missing yeah, I see at least one on the fin, and then just below it, there's another missing, um, I, I would call it like the shoulder blade, but it's the leading arrow surface on that, uh, the flap, or before you get to the flap, there's a tile missing there as well, or at least part of the tile missing. Sometimes you get some interesting things with the tiles. Um, if you have a tile fall off from above, it can knock off the tiles below. That's the only downside for the, the flaps on that part. Uh, but if there's at least tile material there and it's glued on and stained in place, uh, it's by far better than nothing. Something is always better than nothing. Um, Stephen, while we're awaiting the start of the prop transfer demo, which is coming up in about four-ish minutes, um, just thinking about uh, heat shield properties and, and the importance of this and, and robustly testing it out, makes me think of the work that NASA's and its partners um, and Lockheed Martin and others are, are doing on studying the heat shield, which I believe is uh, now at the Armstrong test facility up at uh, Glenn Research Center in Ohio as they're looking to make sure they fully understand the impacts of reentry from the Artemis 1 mission. And, you know, that's one of the watch items and one of the reasons why Artemis 2 was pushed out uh, a year beyond its initial timeline. I guess just your your overall thoughts on the the trickiness of getting heat shields right, given the reporting that you've done both on Artemis and Starship. And yeah, heat shields obviously are very important uh, for getting the vehicle back through the atmosphere. And uh, this architecture that Starship uses is uh, kind of similar to the space shuttle with these ceramic tiles that are adhered to the body of the vehicle. A uh, key difference between the shuttle and Starship is uh, Starship is an inline vehicle. There's no vehicle. It's not uh, hanging on the side of the rocket like the shuttle was. So you're not worried about falling uh, debris, hitting the heat shield or tiles and knocking them away. Uh, but uh, Dialing in uh, the the uh, uh, adhesive and the uh, the way you attach these tiles to the structure uh, is going to take some uh, fine tuning, I think, uh, over a number of flights. And uh, of course, SpaceX, uh, since they're using stainless steel, it can withstand some higher temperatures, so they don't need to cover the entire vehicle in this uh, heat shield in these tiles. But uh, you, you mentioned the Artemis One heat shield. That's a it's a different architecture. It's an ablative heat shield, but uh, it just maybe drives home the point that watching uh, the uh, performance of the heat shield and uh, learning about how those perform in the hypersonic environment as the temperatures build up to thousands of degrees is uh, you know that you can do the modeling, you can do the simulations on Earth and arc jet facilities, for example. But getting the data in flight is crucial. And getting through this launch with Starship, getting it into uh, space, 
uh, we're about to finally, SpaceX is about to finally uh, gather some flight data on how the tiles perform. Sorry, I was on a on a muted mic. Um, what I was saying offline, which no one could hear, was uh, we should be about forty five seconds into the propellant transfer demo. Although SpaceX, uh, I believe, mentioned that they were going off comms and are playing their version of elevator music while they paused their commentary until uh, the Raptor in flight uh, in space relight demo, I should say. coming up at plus 40 minutes and 46 seconds. So hopefully we'll get some type of graphical information possibly on the prop demo transfer. So we're not uh, waiting until SpaceX comes back in to give us an update on that. Uh, we'll also be keeping an eye on their social channels as well. So uh, folks in the, the live chats for Lab Padre and Spaceflight now, if you happen to catch an update before we get to it as we're watching a number of things here uh just go ahead and drop that in the live chats for either of our channels just going back to uh some of the things that we've been learning while we're waiting for more information on that prop demo transfer or prop transfer demo uh Thomas, you made a, a good point about, you know, some of the things that we're learning sort of structurally that are sort of a read between the lines kinds of moments. And uh, I think we we were able to gather some more data about, you know, the oh, onboard cams wind tolerance. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, payload door is still open, so that's going to be weird. Luckily, it's on the uh, leeward side. side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if it was the opposite side, it'd be done for, of course. But you know, being on the leeward side, we're we're still okay. It's the the question of the tiles. How many in the in those areas that have tiles removed? Is it so one tile could be enough if it's in the wrong spot? Um, but the stainless steel is very strong. We've we've seen it uh, undergo quite a few different tests. Basically, you're hitting the upper atmosphere and it's it's basically pulverizing these atoms of uh um uh, uh like oxygen all the other stuff into the vehicle not oxygen what is it anyways it's <laughs> creating plasmas um and, and ripping uh, things it's it's bad but the, the the best part about this is that we they they will be able to learn from all of the light information that and everything they've seen in the videos to make the vehicle better so we got what 99 percent away uh, of the way with the booster on this this run it was just that last little bit and it would have basically done a splashdown uh the other piece that they will have is the location information like how precise was that landing towards the end because they were trying to do a precise landing as if this was a um simulated chopsticks landing but it's out in the ocean there's obviously no chopsticks out there So there's that approach that they're taking, trying to verify that system even before they even look at catching a booster. They want to make sure that it can be done before they try to do such a thing. And just want to note that uh, SpaceX said the propellant transfer demo has been completed. So that's another good milestone notch there. And we're now at T plus 28, or excuse me, yeah, 29 minutes and counting. So the payload door should be closing right about now or in the process of closing. I'm trying to sort of strain our eyes and see if we can see any definitive movement on the door. Hopefully these live pictures will be able to hold at the door closing sequence can be shared in real time.
the deceiving part it's fluctuating is the does it look like the ship is rotating in any way oh, okay I'm not sure why yeah, you'd be I seeing that. I believe uh, it's been rolling a little bit. Okay. That'll explain why we would be seeing the, the light in, increase and decrease. So that was kind of deceptive. Every time it's like, oh, it's about to close. Nope. That's just a roll. The rest of the door needs to close on the other side. Oh, there it goes. Oh, wow. Look at that. Uh oh. seemed to wiggle a little bit as it was closing, but it didn't appear to close all the way. Although SpaceX just uh, posted that the Pez door checkout is complete, door closing and HD views are over. So I guess we've seen the last of the interior of Starship on this flight. Well, at this point, uh, the exterior is going to be the most interesting thing in general. So I'm I'm happy to see all of these views, especially the Earth going by. This is fantastic. So as we're seeing uh, the Earth roll, or rather Starship rolling and the Earth views spinning around it from this fixed onboard camera view, maybe rolling a, a bit more than would be ideal. Obviously, they want to control the roll as it makes its descent down, heading in for a, what SpaceX is hoping would be a controlled splashdown. Uh, Stephen, you were mentioning sort of some of the similarities between uh, SpaceX's Starship and uh, uh, Space oh, Shuttle. Not, uh, Obviously, two very different vehicles, okay. but everything's. Like, he was, he was talking about this state, uh, <laughs> the the Space Shuttle and uh, the, this vehicle, and they're two different vehicles. Sorry, it's like we may be working through some technical difficulties. Yeah, he's he's off at the moment. Uh, so I, I just relayed what I could last moment there, but I'm not the uh, expert on the shuttle. But the the shuttle tile system is uh, is very interesting because it is um, basically the the same shuttle. Uh, I'm sorry, the tile system and then the Starship is very much the same system that they're using here, at least the advanced versions. And they've changed up the recipe. There was a great video that was out there it's no longer available that was uh somebody had a, a starship uh, tile and a heat shuttle or a space shuttle uh tile and they went through did an electron micro microscope on it and confirmed that it looked to be the same materials that they would be expecting with the uh the advanced versions of the space shuttle but these are more custom so one thing they did was make them a bit stronger by putting in basically aluminum in and things like that. But it's it's a very interesting process that they're going through. And uh, the entire uh, the team that is working on these heat shuttle tiles, or the, 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 wow, I only got three and a half hours of sleep the past 20, or 48 hours. So <laughs> I, I feel selling you. over myself. <laughs> Everybody here gets sleep deprived when they do this, but it's uh, amazing. So... You, you should come out and watch uh, the, the Starship launch next time you can, Will. 
but yeah, it's uh, it's incredible how much effort they put into this to make it work. Uh, and they changed out the different ways they attach the glues and the different types of glues. So there's a lot of uh, change going on there as well. But so far, everything on the Starship has looked to be uh, fairly successful. The The biggest part is for them to get at least the test data to find the faults in the system uh, or the things where they were not expecting values that were there. And so those are either you know, too conservative, too liberal on the values. Um, so they need to adjust what the the information that they are, are getting back and put those back into their models and everything else and make those changes that they need to. So we're going to see a lot more changes, I suspect, on Starships uh, coming up to fix some of these. One of the things that Starship or SpaceX does on Starship is occasionally they will skip a ship if they have too many things to change or do. Um, but if there's small enough changes that they can upgrade, they will do that. Uh, so we've got quite a few in the works. They will want to uh, test other uh, systems, obviously deploy satellites. So there's a plenty more to do, even if the, let's say that the thermal management of the uh, uh, PPS doesn't work uh, properly or, or the uh, glue or whatever it was, it's gonna be very interesting to see. Absolutely. and. Zach, if you're still with us, I, I believe you are. Um, you know, I am. We're, we're, I'm just really enjoying these orbital barrel barrel rolls that are happening right now. Well, and I wanted to ask oh, you about is, is that, the, the that we're seeing. Um, that may have been, and no, well, I don't think Too so early? unless they're very early on the timeline here. Um, the relight should not be until T plus 40 minutes and 46 seconds. So, uh, but Zach, what I wanted to ask you was um, the amount of rolling that we're seeing, is that to be expected here? Um, I mean, it seems like um, they may be doing some venting as well that may be contributing to the roll. It's tough to say. I mean... It almost looks like they're showing off a little bit. Um, I, I'd, I'd hope it's intentional and not out of control, but I think we'll be able to tell very quickly because it once it reaches that reentry, it'll probably stop. The funny thing is their awaiting acquisition of Signal is doing barrel rolls as well. So um, <laughs> I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think maybe they're just testing how much control they have um and that that could be part of it but um yeah it's yeah. certainly odd yeah steven was just uh saying in my ear steven young our editor here at space flight now that um the graphical position is based off the antenna on starship and you can see at the bottom but let's uh, listen in here to SpaceX briefly. Our main objective today was to get through all of our ascent burns and collect as much data as possible, including a potential Starship entry. And we just came out of a coast phase and we're treated to a number of HD views thanks to Starlink, uh, including the PES door open close test. So that was one of our test objectives today that we met. So that's awesome. It has been such a great day. It has been a phenomenal test day uh, just, just to see boost Awesome. lifting a starship a to ascend, day. ship it's completing its ascent. Day. Just just, uh, just wonderful day. Uh, kind of to recap the objectives a, a little bit. Ascend, booster completed its ascent, ascent, ignited its 33 Raptor day. engines. Uh, we demonstrated a successful hot staging for the second booster time. Completed booster completed the boost back burn, didn't quite accomplish the landing burn, and then had a hard splashdown in the Gulf. Meanwhile, a ship completely successful after the hot staging. We had a good six engine burn of the Raptor vacuum engines and uh, sea level engines. And then we've commanded a number of demonstrations, including uh, the, the Starlink satellite deploy demo, so the payload door, as well as a prop transfer demonstration. We do still need to do some data review on those. So <laughs> as we get that data back, uh, we'll be sure to update you on social for how those tests went. We are coming up on our next major milestones, which is an in-space relight of our Raptor engine for the first time, followed by re-entry and then landing <laughs> yeah. in the Indian Ocean. Incredible.
Yeah, that's right, guys. We should be just a couple, just about 40 seconds away, 40 or 50 seconds away uh, if we do this relight demo. Do want to stress this is not a deorbit burn. Um, in fact, it's actually going to function a little bit opposite of a deorbit burn. We're going to be raising our perigee with this burn for the lowest point of our orbit. This is just to demonstrate that we can relight a Raptor engine on ship while it's gone through a coast, while it's in outer space, while it's in microgravity. All of the different complexities that come with lighting this engine again after it's already done an ascent burn, but you're now coasting through space. This is going to be really important. Anytime we want to do in-space maneuvers in the future, like eventual deorbit burns, um, any of our uh, translunar injections that will have uh, Raptor engines firing back up. Um, we may not do it. There is all of the guidance is loaded into Starship's computer itself. So if it doesn't see the values that it needs to, we could just skip the burn. Um, so we are waiting to find out uh, if that's going to happen or not. Uh, if it doesn't, as we said in the beginning, we're on a pretty steep trajectory that we are coming home no matter what, regardless of doing a burn. Uh, this was done just so we can really, we're in a trajectory that's really not super susceptible to delta V changes in velocity. Uh, if we were to do a burn, we've got a pretty con uh, pretty concise footprint in the, Indi Indi in the Indian Ocean uh, that we're going to be targeting for splashdown today. Um, it does sound like we are skipping past the on-orbit relight demo this time. Um, again, we'll, we'll confirm all of this through our post-flight data review, uh, but it did sound like we did pass through that burn. Um, so now that's going to start setting us up for re-entry. Yeah, that's exactly right. So coming up next around T plus 49 minutes is Starship re-entry. Now, this is typically a portion of flight where we around T plus 40. And so, as we heard from SpaceX's Dan Holt, that they are going to be passing over the Raptor in-space reflight demo. So, uh, one of the boxes that will remain open today, uh, an important test that they were hoping to hit, um, that they just are going to be moving by setting up for re-entry, coming up at T plus 49 minutes and 5 seconds. Um, bringing back in our panel here, looking at some great views from uh, Starship upper stage. Uh, Steven, are you surprised that they moved on by the the Raptor relight? And you know how important of a box is it that's now left open? Um. Well, hold on. Sorry, we got these views back. It looks like it's. Can't tell if it's orienting itself for re-entry or not. It seems to still be spinning. Now, this is only the second time that we're testing Starlink during re-entry. So even though we do have these great visuals now, yeah, we'll have, have to keep an eye out on that. Um, learning about what that wake will actually look like in practice and whether we're able to get that live view. While we're continuing during re-entry, track through that. Uh, Stephen, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on on the fact that they skipped over. If if Stephen is is with us, I'm not sure. Um, if he's not, then uh, Thomas, your your thoughts on them skipping over the uh, the reflight milestone? Hey, Will, can uh, you hear me? Of that, yes, I can. Yeah, this is Stephen. Okay, that that's uh, that that was a stretch goal, I think, for SpaceX. Uh, however, it does. Uh, to me, bring into question, maybe a slight question mark, over uh, whether they will actually be able to target low Earth orbit on the next flight. Because uh, as we talked about before, SpaceX didn't want to put this large object, Starship, into orbit uh, without proving they can get it out of orbit. Because uh, leaving it in orbit, they're intact. 
or uh, debris, worse, uh, would uh, could cause a problem with a uh, space junk. Uh, so uh, I think not proving they can do over it, they can. Hey, Stephen. Uh, start. Sorry, sorry to interject. Um, just as we're watching these live pictures here, um, we're seeing quite a bit of debris falling away from ship 28. Um, not entirely sure if we're seeing it start to break apart here or not, but we're seeing, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's actually, yeah, and it looks a little, a much more stable. What's the current altitude? Looks so like we've been getting some some plasma forming. That's incredible. Some fantastic views of reentry here. At T plus forty six minutes forty four seconds and counting. No, it's it's uh, not where we were expecting it to be. And you can see it, the, the graphical representation on the bottom, just off center of the screen. We'll see how long these onboard camera views last at this point. I think these views are coming through Starlink. I'm coming up on 48 minutes in flight. Yeah, no, we're still with it. A little over 48 minutes in flight and And it's uh, moving at a pretty blistering speed here as it's now less than 80 kilometers above the Earth's surface. But it's hitting right about at the point where Starship entry was expected. The video stuttering. It looks like it came back briefly, and now we're seeing a split-screen view of the control rooms in Hawthorne, California, as well as in Starbase. But they still have signal. So re-entry continues underway. Telemetry data is still coming down. So while we don't have onboard camera views at the moment, the data stream still appears to be live, so the ship also appears to still be in play. Uh, let's listen into SpaceX.
Absolutely incredible. Major test milestone, something we wanted to accomplish on flight two, getting to it today. So just awesome. Now, we actually have some heat shields here. So these are what's doing all the work on Starship right now. Uh, there are 18,000 hexagonal uh, heat shields like these. Uh, so this one that I have is flat, like this is what would be positioned on the like flaps the of Starship, whereas Shiva has something a little different. Frozen, yeah, the, so. the one I have would be on the curved surfaces of Starship. I'll just put it in frame here. So we've got these attached at various points around the vehicle. Like you said, Kate, 18,000 of these tiles around, and they're doing the work to make sure that the structure of the vehicle doesn't carry all that thermal load so we can recover the vehicles eventually and, and get to rapid reuse on yeah. them. They're really lightweight. Uh, they, they sound um, a little different than I would have expected them to, but they are ceramic. Um, and these are, are what's helping Starship uh, survive through this period of entry. Um, we're not sure how far we're gonna make it. Again, this is the furthest that we've gotten uh, in our test flight, but the further we fly, the more data that we can get, and that's ultimately uh, the measure of success here, which, I, I mean, I think today has been a huge success given where, we, uh, where we've gone and how much further we've gotten. So with the telemetry data frozen, they may have lost the vehicle that we're waiting for definitive confirmation. Their count or their uh, mission clock is still in motion. So there may be either a disruption of data coming down or they've actually lost the, the vehicle, but they're still talking about the uh, heat shield tiles and uh, vamping as though the, the mission is still in motion. So uh, bringing the, the panel back in, um, Zach, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, you know, given the fact that the telemetry data has frozen, um, what does that tell you at this point? Um. I mean, I, I think they probably definitely lost the vehicle. Um, that wouldn't really surprise me given the way that it was kind of tumbling a little bit while it was reentering. Um, but man, I mean, uh, I, I would say the unfortunate thing about that is that it, to me, doesn't, it isn't really like a, a, the best test of the actual tiles, um, given that portions of that re-entry it was actually tumbling and the plasma was kind of on the unshielded side at times um but i mean overall i would say you know a lot of people probably didn't expect it to reach this far and that that it still seems to me like a really good success like just everything overall with this launch is um just phenomenal kind of speechless a little bit and it Looks like we're getting an update we're from We're going to get data SpaceX's back from Dan. this ship. We might be in a bit of a blackout Steven, period right now. Yeah. So, right so right still now waiting to hear waiting the status on it. But yeah, it was, we got to the, the actual data. entry portion of today. We started into peak heating, which was just a really big milestone. Uh, Starship is pretty unique in the way that it re-enters, especially for something reusable. The closest parallel has been the space shuttle. Um, when we're comparing starship to like when we bring a falcon 9 booster back we're talking about 20 times the energy given the velocity that we're moving at and all of that energy just gets converted into heat and then we need to use those tiles to just help dissipate that heat they're not ablative like you would see on something like dragon which uses an ablative in the capsule shape um, so they are these tiles that are made to be reusable. So any data we're getting on the actual temperatures it was seen during heating, um, all of that is just really hugely valuable. Uh, where Starship is really unique is, and Kate and Shiva have talked about it a couple of times, is once we're through this kind of hypersonic uh, section and we get down to the subsonic. And that's where we really learned a lot and proved that Starship's really just its basic shape could work. Uh, and we did that during the suborbital campaign. Uh, again, if you compare it to the shuttle, which entered, it had the wings. It had a similar heat shield system, but it had wings. 
uh, and then was almost flown like a glider once it re-entered and was down to those subsonic speeds. Uh, with Starship, we're not doing that. We're just coming straight down. Uh, we'll hit terminal velocity, which with Starship is around 200 miles an hour. And then we use a flip maneuver to ignite those engines, do a landing burn, and then touch down on the ground. Uh, so you don't need a runway. We're doing that, again, designed because when we go to the moon, when we go to Mars, uh, there's not going to be a runway there for us. And so that propulsive landing uh, is going to be really important. This is an animation of pretty much what we were just watching on actual Starship video, which is pretty incredible. Um, but we go through peak heating. Uh, one of the benefits of today's trajectory, actually, we got closer to what the heating profile will be on just a normal mission uh, when you compare it to our previous flights, which were headed out to Hawaii. Um, so we go through peak heating, and then we hit subsonic, and then uh, Starship splashes down in the ocean. Again, we're not doing a landing burn on this flight, uh, and we're not expecting Starship to survive the impact. We're not going to be recovering any of the hardware. Uh, for now, though, we are just still waiting to see if we're going to get some signal back. We're currently at a loss of signal with Starship. Uh, don't know for sure what its status is, and so we're just continuing to listen in. But it was pretty incredible seeing the flaps really do their thing to maneuver the vehicle as it's moving through hypersonic. Uh, one of the big trade-offs between something like shuttle and Starship is wings can be pretty heavy. Um, and so if we can really demonstrate that Starship's controllable through that hypersonic regime when you're coming through the atmosphere, you know, 25 times the speed of sound, uh, you can save a whole lot of weight by not having really big wings. So super valuable to get yeah. this data, super valuable um, and to Dan, then figure out what we're going to do on our next test flights. Yeah, and you would brought up a really interesting point, too, that for, for on shuttle, you are gliding in, going back to a runway on Starship because we're landing vertically. We are basically coming down, and then we've seen this during the suborbital campaign. We're not going to see it today, but during the suborbital campaign, we did the flip maneuver and then the light. And so, uh, another good update from SpaceX is Dan Hote about the current status of ship 28 that they are currently in a blackout period so there is some chance that they may reacquire signal on starship if the vehicle has not been lost at this point we are currently sitting on the timeline so you can see here on your screen at t plus 57 minutes 45 seconds and counting on this mission where we should be in the timeline if things are continuing on some semblance of uh, what you would call on track. Starship should pass the point of uh, transonic at T plus one hour, two minutes and 16 seconds. Then it should be subsonic at T plus one hour, three minutes and four seconds with a splashdown around T plus one hour, four minutes, 39 seconds. So it's unclear if, uh, as we saw with some of the, the tumbling and the loss of some of the tiles, if that has uh, pushed forward or entirely scuttled the remainder of the timeline here, and if there's anything left that's actually remaining, obviously we're going to continue to stay with this until we have definitive word from SpaceX that the vehicle has been lost or if it was able to make it down for a splashdown largely intact. As we're waiting, Thomas, if I uh, want to bring you back in here, um, you know, saw a number of tiles. We saw quite a bit of, of rotation as the vehicle was coming back in. And we heard from Dan that, you know, that they learned a lot, especially as uh, Ship 28 was coming in for its you know, early stages of reentry. Um, how valuable is the data that they were able to acquire up to this point, even if it, they're not able to see the full belly flop that they were hoping for. Hey, Will, this is uh, Stephen. Yeah, Thomas Stephen, go ahead. Away. But I can uh, touch, on, touch on that. Yeah, please. The, and uh, um, before I you do, uh, Zach, if, if you could uh, 
mute your mic for a, a minute. I think we're still hearing SpaceX through your channel. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, so I think Starship was instrumented with uh, uh, various uh, structural pressure sensors, sensors, uh, temperature sensors, load sensors, as well as the video that we were seeing from the cameras on board. All of that should give engineers some information about how the vehicle uh, was or was not control controllable during the initial portion of the entry, as well as uh, whether different sensitive parts of the vehicle were getting uh, to temperatures that were higher than expected. They can determine whether the heat shield was doing its job. Like we said before, we saw several tiles uh, fall off or were missing from the, from the ship. So, uh, and our Tedra's data flow at the exact same time. Now, uh, what they if measured, both of those signals are cutting uh, out at the exact same time, that could mean we lost the ship. It has been several minutes models, since we've gotten uh, any data from Starship. We are waiting just a couple more minutes um, just to see if we can get any additional confirmation, but that is one data point that we're tracking, uh, and that could indicate that we had a loss or a breakup of the ship during that re-entry. So uh, might not make it all the way to Splashdown to, today, uh, uh, but there. we were um, able to get through the dance, early phases uh, of re-entry, hit some of that peak uh, heating, audio here. Uh, which was just really incredible to see a Starship Dennis. coming back from space after getting all those views from space for the very first time. Um, so we'll we'll just keep on listening in on the loops here, see if we hear anything over the next couple of minutes. Uh, and that might bring a close to a pretty successful day so far. Um, so again, we did lose the TDRS. That's the tracking and data relay satellite. That's uh, the satellite system that pretty much every spacecraft operating in orbit right now uh, will use to get data. Uh, we were able to get some signal through that. Um, and then we were also getting data back through Starlink. Sorry to have cut you out there, Stephen, um, but please continue. Yeah, well, that was about it, really. Uh, just as they continue to work through whatever signal they may or may not have at this point, um, you know, sort of continuing that line of thought, Stephen, um, given the importance of seeing this be as successful as possible, you know, for not only SpaceX's purposes, but as we've talked about throughout the broadcast, NASA and the Artemis program really needing to to see progress here. Do you think and and you know that not asking you to to speak for any agency or certainly for for NASA, but just based on your reporting and and your assessment of what they were watching and and wanting to see from a Starship third flight, do you think they got far enough to sort of place a good mile marker in the the journey to you know the human landing system version of Starship with this flight? Yeah, I think this was a good progress from NASA's perspective. We heard the SpaceX team say they completed the tank-to-tank yeah, -tank propellant transfer. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how efficiently the liquid oxygen was transferred, because they're often looking at uh, propellant losses uh, through boil-off that happens during that transfer. And there's a big question mark over whether they lose one or two or five or 10% of the propellant during the transfer to boil off. So uh, having that number uh, will help them lead into the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer sometime down the road. And then eventually will lead into the tanker flights to refuel the Starship, a human landing system in low Earth orbit. The big question mark, we've always been asking for years now, 
how many tanker flights will it take to uh, refill a uh, human landing system Starship? The most recent number we received from SpaceX was 10-ish. That uh, uncertainty is not knowing how efficiently the cryogenic propellant transfer will actually go in low Earth orbit. So having this data will give them a better idea. And it's probably going to take several flights, several ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfers to really fine-tune that number and uh, have a, a really firm understanding of how efficiently they can transfer cryos in LEO. Yeah, not only that, but also, you know, how quickly can they get multiple starships launched and up to orbit, dock with each other, and start the propellant transfer? I mean, it's a, it's a whole song and dance that, you know, we're just now starting to see the opening salvos of, you know, actualized for for SpaceX and Starship. Exactly. They can't do it till they have two launch pads ready. Speaking of, of that, uh, either for Zach or I think Thomas has still stepped away, so I'll, I'll put this to Zach. You know, we've seen a number of the uh, tower segments that have been so, transferred from uh, as we were here in Florida. Possibly expecting, we lost the data Starbase a couple of minutes ago. Texas. We haven't heard from the ship uh, up until this point, and so the team has made the call. That ship uh, has been lost. So no splashdown today, uh, but again, just it's incredible to see how much further we got this time around. We had a couple of those ambitious objectives that you guys were just walking through that we're able to take advantage of while a starship was in outer space flying uh, over our planet for the very first time. So that was uh, just really incredible. Um, obviously, there's a lot to go through. Um, everyone always wants to know right off the bat what happened. Takes us a little bit of time. Uh, but I can assure you, as soon as we start finding things out, we're going to let everybody know. Uh, and I know everybody's going to be excited, excited for the next one. I mean, as, as I pointed out at the beginning, there's four super heavy boosters either fully stacked or getting stacked right behind me. We've got other ships ready to go as well. Uh, so it's going to be a really busy time down here at Starbase as we look to really fly Starship as much as possible, get this vehicle ready to go for all the important things it's got to go do. And with that... And with that, we do have the the final word there that um, SpaceX has called the ball game here for the third flight of Starship. Sorry about that. I was actually muted and I was uh, sitting here talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, sorry. So uh, I, I think that the, the second integration tower um, is obviously going to be done in phases. So I think before flight... Four, they're probably going to want to um, at least have the foundation of the tower completed. Um, I imagine the entire process will at least take a full year, but um, the right now they're currently working on uh, preparing the foundation. So they're using a they're they're drilling for um, for their their drainage system essentially to stabilize the um, subsoil, and then the next step after that will actually be to start drilling um uh the um pilings for the concrete for the base of the both the tower and the launch mount um so i imagine that at least that step will probably be completed by the time of the next launch um and aspirationally they'll probably have the base of the tower completed um by then but uh, with the it seems like they're going to want to move really quickly with the next launch if they can especially if they don't have another post-incident investigation, I imagine they probably won't have one um, based on how this flight went. Um, I mean, obviously there's probably still a chance of it happening, um, but if they don't, then that'll definitely speed up their time between the next launch. Um, so with that said, they're going to have to work around their own launch cadence in order to uh, complete that second tower, which is going to be the difficult part because they've already stated that they don't want to interrupt testing and flight operations um, so yeah, I think, um, overall it'll probably take about a year to finish. I actually wouldn't be surprised if pad 39A becomes operational in the time that it takes for them to complete the second tower. They haven't mentioned anything 
um, about continuing work on that second tower, but we have seen them uh, as of yesterday continue um, work on the actual legs of the launch mount at pad 39A. Um, so it seems like they uh, are back in business out there possibly. Uh, it's really tough to tell, but I think over the next few days, we'll definitely be able to see whether or not they're actually continuing on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, essentially they have two towers under construction at the same time right now. Yeah, and as we've been saying, that's going to be a critical pathway towards getting into some of their big milestones that they need to notch to make this program as robust and successful as they hope and want it to be and need it to be, frankly. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I may have to hop off here. It's been a long day for me. I'm going on like 29 hours of being awake. <laughs> so uh, I may have, to, I'm going to have to hop off so I can get some sleep. I still got to work tomorrow or today, actually. Um, but it was awesome being on here. It was amazing watching, uh, watching this milestone. Um, and uh, glad I was able to hop on with you guys. Absolutely, Zach. Well, it's always a, a pleasure to have you and your expertise and we'll look forward to seeing your next video on CSI Starbase of the, the full breakdown of what we saw here. So really appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Thank you. See you all. Thanks, man. Okay. And with that, we're going to go ahead and start to wind things down and uh, let our guests go. But before we do, um, obviously, we just heard parting words from Zach, but uh, Thomas and then uh, Stephen will go to you if if Thomas is still there. I'm not sure if he's come yeah, back. Yeah, I'm or uh, not. just got back. <laughs> oh, fabulous! Uh, so I guess just your your final thoughts on on this mission today and uh, where folks can keep up with you. You know, if they'd like to keep following your work. They are inching closer and closer to a full, a fully successful starship, because like every little thing we've seen today, says that. They had some issues here and there, but they accomplished everything they didn't last time, plus some more. So there is um, a whole slew of things that they now have to work on, but progress now is being made and the knowledge has been gained. So the progress of the future is here. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Thomas. And uh, Stephen, give you a... a parting thoughts on Starship IFT3, where we go from here, and uh, also where folks can keep up with your work. Yeah, this was a successful day for SpaceX, in my opinion. They achieved uh, quite a bit. They progressed further into the flight sequence uh, than they did on IFT2. They have proven that Starship uh, could make it into low Earth orbit. Obviously, the flight profile did not target uh, low Earth orbit. It targeted just shy of orbital velocity. But no reason to think those engines on Starship couldn't burn a few seconds longer to reach low Earth orbit. Uh, I think the reentry portion, they need uh, to do some more flight tests to prove they can uh, get Starship to survive the descent through the atmosphere down to the uh, Earth's surface. One question mark that I would uh, take away from this flight is the fact that they skipped over the relight of the Raptor engine in space. Uh, so I'm not sure whether that's going to preclude them from actually going to low Earth orbit on the next flight with uh, Starlink satellites on board, for, ex for example. So they might want to prove that they can get to get out of low Earth orbit and uh, re-enter the atmosphere uh, uh, before they actually put the ship into LEO with satellites. So we may see this uh, similar profile on the next time. Be, that's something I'll be watching for over the next couple of weeks or next couple of months to see if they actually are going to target low Earth, low Earth orbit or do a similar suborbital sub -orbital profile. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see. It sounds like, um, you know, in the, the general um, approval for this mission that um, 
yeah, they're they're clearing the way for more flights that are heading towards the Indian Ocean. So it seems more than reasonable that we may see a, a replication of this flow, uh, flight profile in the months to come. Or just uh, as you see in the, the left-hand side of the screen, panning around and taking a look at some of the cameras and camera bodies that were set up during uh, remote camera setup. Looks like some fared upright better than others. And I know once all clear is given, uh, photographers will be eager to go out and gather up their cameras and see what they were able to capture of this historic third flight test of Starship. Yeah, well, I think I think you're right on that. Uh, they will probably target another Indian Ocean splashdown next time. Uh, and one thing to note in the FAA license in the environmental assessment for this flight, they said any vehicle breakups prior to Starship intact impact would be considered an anomaly. So I think there will be a, a at least some small mishap investigation uh, from the FAA for this flight. And uh, I think it'll be kind of abbreviated, a shorter investigation than the first two flights. But I think there probably will be a formal uh, mishap investigation. Yeah, I've been uh, refreshing my email as we've been talking to see if we've gotten any word yet from the FAA that they're go ahead and putting that in work. But that will probably come uh, later today, I would imagine, based off of the timing of when the FAA announcement on that came following the uh the ruds in IFT2 so that'll that'll be something that we will all be watching for and we'll we'll definitely keep all of you out there apprised on our various media outlet channels here but sincere thank you to uh to Thomas and and to you Stephen for for both joining us with your commentary and insight and you can find Thomas. Obviously, he's been uh, presence with with Lab Padre for quite some time, and you can find Stephen Clark uh, both on social media as well as reporting for Ars Technica. We'll go ahead and let you go, Stephen, so you can start working on your thoughts and your your piece on this, and we'll look forward to to reading that later on in the day. Thanks, Will. We appreciate the both of you for being with us. Yeah, thank you, Will. It was a pleasure to join you today and uh, see the launch. My gosh, that was amazing. And uh, we'll uh, probably be headed over and watching uh, the aftermath of the, the site here in a little while after that the uh, photographer's through. Yeah, I guess just uh, watch where you step and don't trip over any of the little bits of debris that we're seeing scattered around. So just yeah, be careful, of course. And thanks again for being with us. So as we complete and wind down our coverage, do want to thank a number of folks for their support since uh, came in as we were going along and it was sort of in the, the heat of the launch moment, but definitely want to give people their uh, flowers for helping support robust coverage since it does take a lot of support for these big launch live streams. And we really appreciate it. And we Definitely want to acknowledge those that are helping us do what we do, both at Space Flight Now as well as at La Padre. So thanks to David uh, Throgmorton for a two dollars super chat. He says, "SpaceX Bog fan called. Of course I can see you. Love that. Not to the drone ship there." Daniel Shea. Uh, this was as we were getting through the uh, countdown the $10 super chat uh, saying there's a 14 knot wind out there at that point, but talking about the ceiling for wind tolerance. I think we can infer some things based off of what we saw with uh, the Starship flight today, but without having uh, firm confirmations on some of those wind upper levels, I would hazard to, to put a firm number on it at this point. But I think that's something that we'll continue to, to watch for moving on forward. Thanks to that guy for a $2 super chat. 
It says uh, build spacecraft, not nukes. A message of peace on this Pi Day. One of our channel members here, uh, SG, with the $3 Super Chats. A little bit of support here. Thank you so much, SG. Really appreciate that. Mel Robert Terrell checking in from Chicago. Hopefully it's a pleasant day in the Windy City. He says, uh, sure glad to watch with Spaceflight now. Y'all are tops. Thank you so much. And we'll share the kudos with Lab Padre as well. Larry Linville with some support from the Philippines. Really appreciate that, Larry. Thank you so much. Josh King with a very generous $20 super chat. Thank you so much for that, Josh. Who says, go Starship, go SpaceX, go Ship 28, Booster 10, go IFT3. RK1983 with a $2 super chat. This uh, coming in just before liftoff at Astra per Aspera. Godspeed, Starship. SO the Tiger with a $5 super chat just before a liftoff saying light this candle. And indeed they did. It was quite the robust mission. A lot of progress forward. Rick Gibbons with a $2 super chat saying let's go Starship. John Bales with a $10 super chat. Thank you so much, John. This says thanks for the coverage. Absolutely. We're more than happy to do it. Jim Edgar with a very generous $50 super chat. Thank you so much, Jim, for supporting us on that level. Who says, uh, Jim Edgar, Lisa Bean, watching again from, and, oh gosh, if I need to get better with this pronunciation on this one. It's an equality, I think. Sorry, Jim, I'll get better at that one. But thank you for the support. United Nations Space Command, pleading to the launch gods at the time to not scrub, and fortunately, they did not. Butterfly with the $2 Super Chat says, thank you for the opportunity to chat with all. Yes, we have some great communities here at Lab Padre and Space Flight now, so it's always wonderful to see it in action on a launch day. The Retired Programmer with a $5 Super Chat. Thank you so much for that support. That guy back again with a $2 Super Chat. Seeing freedom in action. Thank you so much for that. Jane B, $5 super chat of support. Really appreciate that, Jane. Mel coming back again as uh, Ship 28 was cruising, admiring the Earth views. SG with another bit of support, another $5 super chat there. Thank you, SG. Really appreciate that. Calisti Lee with a Generous $20 super chat saying thanks, Will, mods, and all the space flight now and Lab Padre teams for fantastic coverage. I always appreciate the work y'all do to bring these launches to us. And it is very much a team effort. So glad to keep the collaboration going. Smooth juice with a 20 pound sterling super chat. <laughs> Joking that uh, water towers can fly. Brad Hedinger with a $5 super chat says, thank you, Will. Space flight now, friend. Amazing coverage as always. Jumping out of my skin here in Orlando. We made it to orbit. Well, not quite, but definitely a big step forward. Feature is now. Thanks, Brad. And last but not least, uh, Gate and Jay with a five Canadian dollar super chat. Asking about uh, nuclear fusion as a possible uh, source of uh, fuel for Starship. I don't think SpaceX has any nuclear ambitions when it comes to its Starship program. So that's probably not in the cards right now. And, oh, Mermaid Lab's coming in right at the buzzer with a $10 super chat saying, So happy to hang with you guys for this historic launch. Thank you, Mermaid. And with that, that will do it for this third flight of Starship as we pull out to one last open view of the orbital launch mount and a little hopper there in the foreground.
And I know there has also been a number of channel memberships that have been going around in the background here. So definitely want to thank all of you for becoming channel members to either Space Flight Now and or Lab Padre. We both channels rely on channel membership. It helps us keep this uh, these 24-hour streams that we have both here in Starbase as well as <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Cape Canaveral in Florida going, as well as doing robust live coverage like this that is <clears throat> pushing the limits of my voice and all of our uh, sleep tolerance or lack thereof. So I uh, really appreciate all of you for being with us. If you would, on your way out the door, if you're not already subscribed to both Space Flight Now and Lab Padre, be sure to do so. Click the bell icon and turn on all notifications so that you get alerted when we do start these new live streams and post video updates on this and many other topics regarding space flight. I want to thank all the folks behind the scenes that have made this launch coverage possible to the entire team at Lab Padre, all the folks at Space Flight Now for working some very long hours to bring this live coverage to you. Thanks for making that happen. Your hard work does not go unnoticed and we would not be here without it. So thanks to all of you, to all of our moderators who have been in the live chat, helping to keep the uh, chat moving along smoothly. Very much appreciate the work that you do in making these broadcasts come together. As mentioned, but worth repeating, thanks to our channel members for principally helping to keep us afloat in what can be challenging times on a media landscape. So we are very grateful to you as well. Thanks to the camera operators out in the field, to Chief and Adam Bernstein and others for capturing some great views. We're looking forward to seeing what your cameras were able to snap when you pick them up from remote recovery. And most of all, thanks to you at home or wherever you're watching this broadcast, whether you're on the Lab Padre feed or the Space Light Now feed or you're a diehard fan and you have both windows open to give us both simultaneous support. Really appreciate you spending some early hours, possibly depending on where in the world you're joining us for this live coverage and you can be sure that we'll be back with you again when Starship is next ready to take to the skies. And with that, for all of us here, for Lab Padre, for Space Flight Now, it has been a pleasure being at the helm of this virtual ship guiding us through Starship Flight Test Number 3. I'm Will Robinson-Smith. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Hopefully we have one more launch to bring you later today with the flight of uh, Starlink 6-44 from NASA's Kennedy Space Center. That Falcon 9 still poised to fly. Maybe one more launch on the books for SpaceX yet today. We shall see. Regardless, whether we have a launch today or we don't have another launch today, be good to yourselves, be good to others. If we don't see you between now and then, have a wonderful weekend, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.